the 14th Amendment due process rights. I make a reservation for those rights, especially, but all rights at this time. The record to reflect that the individual known to this court as Daryl Brooks is present in person, in custody. He is appearing uh, today in street clothes. He has a dress shirt and a tie on. He's also wearing a mask. And I don't consent to being called that name for the record. As this paperwork I accept for value and return for value as it does not state the correct name. It states the name of my client, the straw man. I am not this name in all capital letters. I do not identify by that name, nor do I know that individual. Your objection is noted it's baseless in law and fact, and <coughs> that is simply a caption on a pleading uh, that on is the not my name. final jury instructions. That is not my name for the record. All right, the record should reflect, Mr. It. Brooks, I'm talking. The record I should reflect that at 3.23 p.m. yesterday, all of the verdict forms were printed off and provided to Mr. Brooks. I also uh, provided him with an excerpt from the bench book on closing arguments. Um, I left a copy on the state's table as well and a second copy on the defense table today as well so that uh, I thought that would be helpful information as we are um, about that time in the proceeding for the parties to uh, give their closing arguments. Of course, prior to that, the court will be reading through the final jury instructions. Um, the parties were also given uh, the updated version following the jury instruction conference yesterday as well. Uh, the total number of pages for that is 107. The court will be reading from the first 73 pages this morning. I do anticipate having to take uh, one or two breaks before I complete all of that. I'm, my plan is to do that uh, and then take the lunch break. Uh, and then when we come back from lunch to have the parties provide their, oh, they're not opening, their closing arguments. And then following the closing arguments, uh, the court has the final uh, jury instructions which go through uh, the closing instruction, uh, instructions 460, 484, and all of the verdicts, uh, and then the instruction to the uh, jury um, 515 about their verdicts needing to be unanimous, and then um, selection of a presiding juror. The very last page, 107, actually is not read until the close of the case and only following um, receipt of verdicts or some other type of disposition that would result in the conclusion of the case. It's the instruction after the verdict is received. So uh, page 107 is not something that will be read uh, today. As indicated yesterday, I will be selecting the alternates by random selection. We'll use the tumbler um, and uh, select three numbers out of that. But that will be done after all of the instructions are read and the parties have an opportunity to give their closing arguments. Uh, Your Honor, I accept for value and return for value any uh, documents that you just alluded to. I have not seen them. Mr. Brooks, if you haven't seen them, that is by your choice. They were provided to you. I know on multiple occasions yesterday you threw items into the garbage can. Um, the court retrieved the final jury instructions. I personally didn't, I had someone do it, had them placed on the table this morning and any other items you threw in the garbage. So is that is that the paperwork that I had to stay here for over an hour for? Sir, I'm not going to discuss any further what we did during the jury instruction conference. The jury's going to be brought jury out instruction a little conference. bit later. <laughs> It, there was a conference. We talking about the proceedings from yesterday or after you had uh, told us we recessed Mr. for Brooks. it? I'm referring to after you called recess for the night yesterday. That's what I'm referring to. Those I, was, documents, I was put in the holding cell for over an hour because they said it was some paperwork that needed to that be. That is correct, sir. You were kept there in order for my clerk, who had to finalize 76 verdicts, two each, one not guilty, one guilty and provide those to the parties. 
Um, is that and so that's why you were kept there so those could be handed to you. My understanding is they were. I would need a bailiff to confirm for me whether he took those back to his cell or if they were put on his desk because he left them um, in the holding cell. Left them in what holding cell? In here? I have to look through his paperwork to see if they're on here. What holding cell are you referring to, Your Honor? Behind the door. I, I didn't leave anything in that holding cell. I was just trying to figure out why I was in there so long. Are those the verdicts? Yeah. All right, he has those. Then. Thank you. Is this the paperwork that was just put on my, it was paperwork on uh, the desk when I came in that was on top of my folders? Mr. Brooks, I know that they were, you were given the opportunity to take them to your cell because that is what I was advised. Whether you did that or not, I don't know. That's but they not are I'm, also on your desk now. I accept for value in return for value any documents. We did discuss all of the jury instructions and the verdicts yesterday. So what was discussed when I was in the cell for over there an hour? There was no discussion, sir. The court was in recess. Madam Clerk was simply finalizing the paperwork <coughs> based upon the discussion that was held on the record in open court yesterday. I was told that I had to stay there uh, per you. Yes, so that we could provide them to you and you would have an opportunity to take them back to your cell. But can they, you wish can they to have been them. delivered to the jail? All right. Um, I don't believe there's any other preliminary issues there we are. need to address other than an advisement I will have for Mr. Brooks. But let me turn to the parties and ask if there's anything preliminary to uh, this phase of the trial, which is the jury instructions, the verdicts, um, and closing arguments from the state. Your Honor, thank you. All right, anything else from you, sir? Yes, there is. Um, yesterday, I uh, stressed to the court numerous times about me not understanding the proceedings um, and essentially how uh, decisions are being made on my behalf without my understanding or giving consent. The court made various rulings yesterday. I made findings and ultimately made some determinations. I stand behind the record that was made. I'm not going to explain it further. So a lot of those decisions were made when I was not present in the courtroom. I was in the other courtroom, correct? That is true, sir. Is that correct? Um, the record will indicate when those were made and where you were. I can't, um, I can't see the record, though. How, how am I supposed to know what the record will reflect? <coughs> Sir, the decisions were made yesterday. I'm not revisiting them today. They need to be revisited, and they, it also needs to be talked about uh, subject matter jurisdiction that has yet to be proven for the record. I'm still trying to understand, Your Honor, how um, you made a, le a, a, a judicial determination on my behalf, which I did not give consent to, to, as you say, I forfeited my right to testify, which I never did. I never said I wanted to. I never said I didn't want to. But that decision was made for me. Also, the decision, the decision for the defense to rest its case was made for me, which I did not consent to, nor did I say I was ready to rest, or nor did I say I did was re ready to rest. I'm trying to understand how all these decisions are being made with, without my consent, without me waiving any rights. I'm, I'm not understanding how, because none of my answers were unresponsive. I just didn't answer the way that Your Honor wanted me to answer, but I stressed yesterday if I don't understand something, how am I supposed to answer a question that I don't under, understand fundamentally? It's not, it's not me saying yes or no, and it's not me saying, okay, I want to waive this or that right. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make an argument with you in any way. I'm just seeking to understand how these decisions are made if I'm letting the court know and I'm putting the court on notice, hey, I don't understand this or I don't understand that. Any other 
things. Otherwise, I'm prepared to address each one of those. Yeah. Um, there was a, a, mention, a mention of um, if there is a conviction in this matter, there is a mention of um, sentencing, which I'm assuming there will be a, some type of um, um, people may want to speak. I know if there is a conviction on my half, people would definitely want to uh, address address the court. Um, there'll be a lot of affairs that need to be put in order, obviously on my side. Um, if it pleases the court, if there is a conviction in this matter, I would like the uh, the sentencing to to not be so quick. I'm, I'm asking if it pleases the court for the sentencing to be held off into a later time, not a day or two or a week, just so that affairs can be put in order properly and so that the people that want to come in and, and speak will have the opportunity to address the court. I think if that's that a fair pleases, request, sir. If that pleases. I think that's uh, a fair request. I thought about that more overnight that it, in the event there is a conviction that um, I would like to give the parties an opportunity to do that. I have no idea how many people would want to speak. My inclination would be again, and I'm, this is not set in stone, if there is a conviction um, on any of these counts, I may ask the parties to just come back in on Monday, October 31st with uh, kind of a proposed plan of how many people do you think will speak on your behalf, how long do you think it will take, um, so that I can look at my calendar and then uh, set aside the appropriate amount of time. I certainly don't want to rush anything, and I think that's a fair request that you're making. Thank you. All right. Um, so with all of that then, sir, subject matter <coughs> jurisdiction, I decline to address that further. I stand by the written decision um, that I've made previously. Um, as far as the rulings made yesterday regarding uh, your ability or inability to present further testimony and witnesses and to testify yourself, the court did make various rulings and findings that you had forfeited your right to do so by conduct. I'm not going to further explain the law or these prior rulings to you. I stand behind them and I believe I made a very, very clear record. Um, so to the extent that you are asking me to reconsider any of that, uh, that's how I would interpret your statements here today. I decline to do so. So, Your Honor, would that be, um, that's still not, I have no understanding to um, why I wasn't given the opportunity to place certain things into evidence. I, I have virtually nothing nothing zero evidence that I was able to place into evidence nothing I disagree with that sir you called I think nine witnesses on your behalf um, on various issues including uh, the honking of the horn the window tinting you cross-examine many of the state's witnesses about police barricades and the presence of police so you did I'm, present evidence I'm speaking to the terms of everything that um, Your Honor asked me to do. You told me to uh, put everything that um, I needed to present to the courts in writing. You you made that ruling. You told me that's what I needed to do. I did that. Um, I, Mr. Brooks, you may have interpreted that. I did not require you to do that as far as evidence in the case. I very expressly told you there are rules of procedure and rules of evidence that govern exhibits, testimony, witnesses, etc. What I told you is that any requests that you have related to the case, if it's a motion, be put in writing. I specifically referenced the statute 80201 regarding how a motion is made and what it should contain, meaning it has a very express uh, request for relief and states the law and the facts upon which the request is being made. Um, again, I'm not going to revisit the prior rulings. Um, I stand behind them, and to the extent that the record does not have 
uh, meaning the record before the jury and the evidence does not have certain pieces of information, evidence or testimony that you uh, wanted to present, um, you forfeited that opportunity <coughs> yesterday based upon your conduct. How did I forfeit the opportunity? Again, I'm not going to revisit that, sir. What I, I will forfeit, tell you is this. How did I forfeit this the opportunity? This jury is here to be able to place into evidence Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to be. debate this further. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to debate. I'm trying to understand. to respect the fact that I've made rulings. Your Honor, that's, that's you it's made a judicial determination. It's not my job to explain them you made to it. you. I'm not asking you to explain anything. You're misinterpreting what I'm trying to ask you and trying to tell you. You're misinterpreting it. With all due respect, Your Honor. I, when you tell me this is what you need to do. I'm going to take it by what you're telling me that I need to do. If I needed to make anything request wise or anything that I needed to present to the court, it has to be in writing. You told me to do that. I did it. You also brought up when I asked numerous times before, before, when would I have a chance to present things into evidence? You told me we were not at the evidentiary phase of the trial yet. So I took that as saying, okay, well, at some point I will have the opportunity to place things in the evidence that need to be put in evidence for the record. So I, I'm not understanding how a decision can be made for me to actually forfeit being able to put things into the record that need to be placed into the record. All these things are, are, are things that, quite frankly, allow me to put on a defense. Uh, things that need to be known, things that should be in the record as far as filings, as far as uh, 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 ICFs that I was told to by you to address certain ICFs either to you or to the clerk of courts which I did and received copies for all of them except until last week. It was a few of them that I didn't receive copies for that I'm still wondering why I haven't received those copies when I received the copies of all the ones before that. But in, in, in terms of that, I did what Your Honor asked me to do. And these are things that were part of my defense that needed to be placed into the record. So where my confusion comes in is not being able to place those things into the record. Things Mr. that, Brooks, things that clearly help my defense. I stand by my ruling. I'm not revisiting it. To the extent that you claim lack of understanding or your lack of consent, it's been made abundantly clear on this record, your position on that. I'm not revisiting it. I'm further advising you that when this jury comes out, I expect that you will honor the decisions that were made, not agree, but you will honor them and not interrupt the court or these proceedings as I instruct the jury. So how am I supposed to put these things in the record that need to be in the Mr. record? Mr. Brooks, I'm well aware of the effect my ruling had, and I'm not going to debate it with you further. I'm ju I just want to know how am I supposed to get these things on the record? How am I supposed to, because the filings that I gave, you actually filed and gave me the copies back. So are those in the record? Mr. Brooks, I'm, I'm just, no longer I'm going just seeking to talk to understand. about this. I'm just seeking to understand. Mr. Brooks, I cannot explain procedure or evidence the filings that or I the filed. rulings or I'm the asking law the question, to Your Honor. you. I'm merely asking the question. The filings that I presented to Your Honor. Any filings with the this court. court are in the court record. That does not mean they're evidence, sir. And I've told you That's that That's not previously. what I'm asking. I'm asking, are the filings part of the record? The filings that were filed in timestamp that were notarized that I presented to the court, all the filings, the appearance bonds, the, the statement of particulars, the, the notice of special appearance, the, the, uh, the, the court docket sheet, your oath of office, everything that I tried to present into the record, how am I not able to make them part of the record? So they were filed because you, you presented them to the court during the course of this case. Anything that was not offered as an exhibit and received during the evidentiary phase is not evidence in this trial. That's what I attempted to do, and you told me that I couldn't. You told Mr. me- Mr. Brooks, I am bringing this jury Your Honor, out. Listen with all to respect, me. you told me that we were not at the evidence. When I said I have 
uh, exhibits as well. I have stuff that I want to put into the record. I even asked, I said, Mr. Brooks, may I give an off, a offer into evidence? I'm these, going to stop you things. once again. I'm not going to have this discussion and debate. The evidentiary phase of this trial is closed. It should we are not now be, though, at the Your jury. Honor. I understand your lack of consent, your objection so when would I is be able noted to put, for the when record. When would I be able to put vital information into the record, which I haven't had the opportunity to that do? That opportunity has closed for you, sir. So so you're saying basically you're, prejudice, you're prejudicing my defense by me not being able to present things into evidence, offer into evidence, filings and important paperwork and documents. Mr. Brooks, and you How forfeited not, your right to do that by your conduct yesterday, and I stand behind that decision. I asked, I'm going I asked to do before the yesterday, sir. Your Honor. I'm going I to asked do the this following. before yesterday. You have not honored my request to you that you cease debating me on prior rulings I'm not trying to debate. I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand why my due process is being violated. Mr. Brooks, the record speaks for itself. No, the record I'm does not. I'm going to take it, it does a five-minute recess. When I come back out, the jury will also be coming out. I'm advising you, there will be no, there will be no multiple opportunities where I uh, give you to conform your conduct to the rules of decorum. Well, then, and then just hold me in contempt, you, then, Your Honor. You are hold hereby me in contempt because I didn't even. I'm trying to seek to understand. If you start talking about subject matter jurisdiction or any of these other, it issues needs to be addressed, or Your Honor. In any way, we're not talking about subject matter jurisdiction. We're talking about why my why my due process I has will been violated. Excuse the jury, and you will be removed Your to Honor, the other courtroom. We're talking about the Fourteenth Amendment, Section right, I'm One. I'm taking a five-minute break. We are Your Honor, I don't agree to a estoppel. I don't agree to a estoppel. Your Honor, as a
the jury is. Your Honor, it has yet to be proven for the record. And upon your refusal, that would be looked at as dishonor. I'm not addressing it. The jury's coming out. So there's, is that a, a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer any questions as a public servant, Your Honor? Therefore, being, that's dishonor. Are you going to honor your oath of office? Stand. I'm not addressing it. Further. Are you going to honor your oath of office? All rise. So I'll take that as a tacit agreement that you're not going to honor your All oath right, of I'm office. All right, I'm going to have to excuse the jury. Mr. Brooks, I warned you that if you made any interruptions when they came out, you would be removed to the courtroom. That's what I'm doing right now. You're forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom unless you can promise me right now you'll respect prior rulings of this court and not interrupt this next phase of the trial, which is the court reading the jury instructions without interruption from you. Can you do that? Have I acted in dishonor, Your Honor? Mr. Brooks, I very expressly warned you. Have I acted in dishonor? You have disobeyed a direct order from this court. Have I acted in dishonor? You have disrupted these proceedings. I have not disrupted these proceedings. Sir, can you pledge to me that when this jury comes back out that you will remain silent and not reference things like subject matter jurisdiction, the court's oath of office, tacit agreements, or anything? Can you pledge that you will respect these proceedings and this jury by not interrupting? Have I acted in dishonor, Your Honor? I will ask you one more time. Can you pledge to be quiet, sir? Why should I, why should I have to make a pledge, Your Honor? Have I acted in dishonor? Because under Illinois v. Allen, I believe you've already forfeited your right to be here, but you can reclaim that as soon as you are willing to conduct yourself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in these proceedings, which at this point in the proceedings, sir, all I am doing is reading through the final jury instructions. I do not want that process interrupted by statements by you that are frankly misstatements of the law. If they're misstatements of the law, Your Honor, how come they haven't been proven for the record? And I'm asking, have I acted in dishonor? All right, he refuses to answer the questions. Have I acted in dishonor, Your Honor? I have given him an ample opportunity to do so. He has forfeited his right to be present for the reading of the jury instructions, and he is to be removed to the neighboring courtroom. We will be in recess until that takes place. Your Honor, have I acted in dishonor?
everyone, please be seated. The record should reflect that Mr. Brooks has been placed in the other courtroom. He is presently on mute so that I can make a record. I do need to confirm that the audio and visual um, equipment and system is working. I am getting a thumbs up from uh, the bailiff. I'll just ask Madam Clerk to confirm with the clerk that's over there as well. I would note Mr. Brooks has the headphones on. Um, this court certainly doesn't take pleasure in removing Mr. Brooks from this courtroom once again. We are at an important stage of this proceeding where the court needs to instruct the jury concerning all of the law that will guide them in their deliberations. Um, as I've put on the record previously, the total pages um, comes to 107. I will be reading this morning through page 73 prior to the parties given the opportunity to make closing arguments and then reading from pages 74 to 106 um, following that. It is very important that the court do this without interruption. Uh, yesterday, this court held a jury instruction conference uh, where both parties had a full and fair opportunity to raise objections regarding any of the proposed jury instructions, to make requests regarding inclusion of any jury instructions that the court did not include, um, as well as review all of the verdict forms. There's absolutely no reason for there to be an interruption or an objection to this process at this time. The court spent the better part of 25 minutes this morning um, with Mr. Brooks raising issues and prior rulings that this court has spent uh, an abundant amount of time on, including subject matter jurisdiction. He continues to claim he did not consent. That's been noted for the record. He continues to claim that he has uh, a limited or no understanding of prior rulings and decisions of this court. Um, I repeatedly advised him I would not be revisiting these issues, that I wanted to go forward with the jury instructions, and repeatedly warned him that any interruption once the jury came out would result in his removal from the courtroom. Again, I take no pleasure in doing that. I prefer that he be here, but frankly, the decision I made here today with the speed at which I made the decision here today is not only to preserve the dignity of these proceedings, but to do so in a way that avoided the court admonishing Mr. Brooks in front of the jury. This, of course, comes on the history in this case with the repeated removals that this court has had to undertake with Mr. Brooks given his conduct and his behavior in this case. I am currently being advised that he would like to come back. That, of course, is always uh, something that I will give him. As soon as I make my full findings, I will pause, and he will be brought back into this courtroom um, so that he can be in attendance when the jury is brought out. Um, of course, my decision that I made this morning to remove him is based on the authority uh, from Illinois versus Allen. Um, I'd also note that State versus Anthony talks about the Allen decision along with State versus Vaughn. Those are two state court decisions. Um, clearly, even though Mr. Brooks was using a mild-mannered tone of voice, he directly disobeyed the court order that he not interrupt once the jury was brought out. He did that immediately upon the first juror walking in. I believe only a few of the jurors even walked in. He was continuing to talk. I immediately removed them from the courtroom to minimize the impact of his disruption. It was clearly disruptive, uh, but again, he is asking to come back, and I will honor that request. I will further advise him, though, that should he interrupt during the jury instruction um, phase of this trial, by either objecting or raising issues uh, that have no bearing on the advisement to the jury by this court of all of the jury instructions, I will uh, 
consider admonishing him in the presence of the jury or simply removing the jury so that then I can admonish him and then making the appropriate record. All right, with that, since he's asking to come back, we will take a pause, we'll recess, we'll come back in when he is set up in this courtroom. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. I'll have the jury brought out then. Record Sub to reflect, we are all back in this courtroom. Before the jury's brought out, can we address subject matter jurisdiction, Your Honor? Before Absolutely the jury's not. brought out? Absolutely not. Is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer those questions as a public servant, Your Honor? So are you going to act in dishonor? Mr. Brooks? Are you going to act I've in dishonor? I've already addressed your requests. It hasn't been proven for the record, Your Honor. It the jury be. is on its way. They're not out yet, though. But man. they're on the way. You held me in contempt. I'm not you held addressing me in contempt these matters, before. sir. Have I, have I acted in dishonor, Your Honor? You held me in contempt without me being in dishonor. How, how have I dishonored the court? Have I acted in dishonor? Have I rose my voice or argued with Your Honor? Have I disrupted the courtroom Mr. Brooks, in any way? you're back in this courtroom at your request. The jury is coming. I never should have Please been. Please be respectful of their time 
through I have, this process. I have been. They weren't even the out before. of the proceedings. They weren't even out before when I was trying to address what needed to be Mr. addressed Brooks, before they came out. Have just I, am I acting to in dishonor? The proceedings. Am I acting in dishonor? So that's a tacit agreement that you don't. Jury, it's a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer questions as a public servant. Right? All right, the jury. No, no jury's out. out, Mr. Brooks. No jury's out. Door. I was trying to address Brooks, this before they, they right came outside out. This door. I am not going to do this with you this morning. You either abide doing, by these rules am I acting and stay in quiet, am or I you will be in, in the other dishonor? courtroom. Am I acting in dishonor? Yes, you are acting How? in dishonor. How? You are disobeying the direct order of this court to respect the decorum and the dignity of these proceedings. You are merely attempting to delay. I don't care what you think. That's not accurate. Mr. Brooks, I am having this jury out. And, and if you and say you're making one word when that door opens, you're making a tacit agreement. Then you will forfeit your right to be present. So you're acting in dishonor, then, Your Honor. All right. The jury may come in. You're acting in dishonor by making a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer any questions as a public servant. You're not holding up to your oath to protect the Constitution. All right. The door is open and he's talking. Okay, so you're going to hold me in All right. contempt? The jury cannot come in. Never mind. Are you going to hold All me right. in contempt? The Mr. Brooks is going to be removed. We're in recess until that. How, am I, how am I acting in dishonor?
Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Can I? We are back on. The record appearances are as they were before. The record to reflect that Mr. Brooks is now in the other courtroom. I currently have him muted so that I can add to the record. Um, I have confirmed he can hear and see as well. I would note he does have the headphones on uh, while in that courtroom. He just lifted them up as well, or at least part of them. Um, this court has previously relied upon uh, the U.S. Supreme Court case of Illinois versus Allen, uh, wherein the United States Supreme Court indicated it is essential to the proper administration of, the criminal, ju of criminal justice that dignity, order, and decorum be the hallmarks of all court proceedings in our country. The flagrant disregard in the courtroom of elementary standards of proper conduct should not and cannot be tolerated. We believe trial judges confronted with disruptive, contemptuous, stubbornly defiant defendants must be given sufficient discretion to meet the circumstances of each case. No one formula for maintaining the appropriate courtroom atmosphere will be best in all situations. We think there are at least, at least three constitutionally permissible ways for a trial judge to handle such a defendant, including one, bind and gag him, thereby keeping him present, two, cite him for contempt, or three, take him out of the courtroom until he promises to conduct himself properly. I understand Mr. Brooks is waving to the court. I'll address that momentarily. Uh, but the bottom line is there is a history of repeated disruptive behavior by Mr. Brooks. I warned him after he came back in, the first thing he wanted to do was address subject matter jurisdiction. Um, that is, from my perspective, um, simply a tactic on his part to delay these proceedings, to disrupt these proceedings. Um, I've, written, written, I've issued a written decision. He has yet to appeal that written decision. He has that right to file an interlocutory appeal. I would also note at no time during this case has jurisdiction ever been challenged uh, when he was represented by an attorney. Um, so I warned him. Um, given the importance of the proceedings and the need for the court to advise this jury without interruption, he was removed once again. I will not bring him back into this courtroom unless he is willing and pledges to conform his conduct and pledge to not interrupt by making any statements when this jury is present and during the court reading all of the jury instructions. I will unmute him so that he can indicate what he would like to say to the court. You are unmuted, sir. Go first ahead. All, I'm not, I'm not, can can y'all hear me? We can. First of all, at 925, I would uh, like the record to reflect that the prosecution was making uh, dispirative remarks and uh, gestures in pursuance to what just happened. I don't appreciate it, and I think that that is very disrespectful for the record. And again, I'm trying to figure out how did I act in dishonor to be removed from the courtroom? How have I acted in dishonor? This is a whole nother, how have I acted in dishonor? All right, I'm going to mute Mr. Brooks. I'm not going to answer that question. I've made my ruling as far as anything that was done by the prosecution. I was not in the courtroom. Um, the jury was not present. Whatever happened, if anything at all, uh, was done outside the presence of the jury. Um, if there is anything the state wants to put on the record right now, I'll give you that opportunity. Otherwise, um, I am going to bring the jury out, Mr. Brooks. Um, if you want to come back into this courtroom, you need to write your request down on a piece of paper, and when you do that, pledge to this court that you will not interrupt these proceedings. Without that, um, I will not uh, bring you back into this courtroom. Um, anything the state wants to put on the record? I have a question, Your Honor. I don't have anything directly in response to Mr. Brooks' last statement. All right, go ahead. Yesterday afternoon when we had the four screen up, there was a wider view of the courtroom so that the jury box could be seen. Is that possible to do? Again? Yes, it is. We can take the witness stand camera and pull it out so that he has a view of the jury box as well. I can't angle it, but I can yeah. 
um, do that. And he and for the record, when you do that, then he can see the jury box. So I would ask that that be done before right. we. Uh, please do that, Madam Clerk. Court TV stand too, and that's why we're supposed to show the jury. That's why I asked you because you need to get back in. Court TV. Well, the it's not on Zoom, and so the Court TV yeah. would be able to fix the camera on me and not on the screen. Uh, so that they don't capture any of the jurors and they're directed to honor that and do that same th same thing obviously with our still photographer um, if there are any images captured of mr brooks um, as you can see the cameras being zoomed out um, you would need to avoid capturing uh, members of the jury Thank you, Your Honor. The record should reflect you have zoomed out the camera, and it looks right. like about 90% of the jury box can now be seen in the view if Mr. Brooks chooses to right. do that. Mr. Brooks, I'll unmute. What is it you would like the court to address? How can uh, how can um, you you rule that I don't have the the right to be present in the, the courtroom? I've answered that previously. I've made my findings under Illinois versus Allen. Um, he continues to interrupt, even if it is by asking questions. Um, I've made my ruling. The record stands. It speaks for itself. Um, and I intend to have the jury brought out. I need one moment um, before I do that. Uh, and so I'm going to just take about a two minute recess.
of time. Yes. All right, we are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before at 945. Mr. Brooks sent a note that says, under Illinois v. Allen, I request for the second to be present at my trial. I never consented to not being present, nor did I act in dishonor because he has not made a pledge to conform his conduct as is required under Illinois versus Allen. Um, he has not reclaimed his right to be present and we will continue with him in the other room. I will also make a finding today and I didn't do this previously, although he's forfeited his right to be present given the technology, the audio and visual equipment that we have, the fact that we've also backed out the one camera so he can see the jurors. I'll make a finding even without that though that it's the functional equivalent of being present in this courtroom. All right, with that, then the, jur the jury uh, will be brought out. I'll remind Mr. Brooks, uh, while he can reclaim the right to come back into the courtroom and make a request, I am going to be adamant uh, that his request uh, include a statement that he's willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concept of courts and judicial proceedings and specifically uh, pledge to not interrupt the reading of the jury instructions. Until such time, he will remain in that courtroom. All right, go ahead. Rise for the jury. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Members of the jury, the court will now instruct you upon the principles of law which you are to follow in considering the evidence and in reaching your verdict. It is your duty to follow all of these instructions. Regardless of any opinion you may have about what the law is or ought to be, you must base your verdict on the law I give you in these instructions. Apply that law to the facts in the case which have been properly proven by the evidence. Consider only the evidence received during this trial and the law as given to you by these instructions and from these alone guide us by, guided by your soundest reason and best judgment reach your verdict. If any member of the jury has an impression of my opinion as to whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty, disregard that in Impression entirely and decide the issues of fact solely as you view the evidence. 
You, the jury, are the sole judges of the facts, and the court is the judge of the law only. The defendant is charged with six separate counts of first-degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon. The first count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did cause the death of Virginia Sorensen with intent to kill that person and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 940.01 sub 1 sub A, 939.50 sub 3 sub A, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The second count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to cause the death of Leanna Owen with intent to kill that person and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 940.01 sub 1 sub A, 939.50 sub 3 sub A, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The third count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to cause the death of Tamara Durand with intent to kill that person and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 940.01 sub 1 sub A, 939.50 sub 3 sub A, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The fourth count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did cause the death of Jane Coolidge with intent to kill that person and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 940.01 sub 1 sub A, 939.50 sub 3 sub A, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The fifth count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did cause the death of Wilhelm Hospital with intent to kill that person and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 940.01 sub 1 sub A, 939.50 sub 3 sub A, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The sixth count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did cause the death of Jackson Sparks with intent to kill that person and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 940.01 sub 1 sub A, 939.50 sub 3 sub A, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. <laughs> the defendant has entered a plea of not guilty to each of these charges, which means the state must prove every element of each offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt. First degree intentional homicide as defined in section 940.01 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin is committed by one who causes the death of another human being with the intent to kill that person or another. Before you may find the defendant guilty of any count of first degree intentional homicide, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following two elements were present with respect to that count. One, as to each count, the defendant caused the death of the victim named in that count. Cause means that the defendant's act was a substantial factor in producing the death. Two, as to each count, the defendant acted with intent to kill the victim named in that count. Intent to kill means that the defendant had the mental purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. While the law requires that the defendant acted with intent to kill, it does not require that the intent exist for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not be brooded over, considered, or reflected upon for a week, a day, an hour, or even for a minute. There need not be any appreciable time between the formation of the intent and the act. The intent to kill may be formed at any time before the act, including the instant before the act, and must continue to exist at the time of the act. 
You cannot look into a person's mind to find intent. Intent to kill must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to a conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. While motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of a defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of a defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe it deserves under all of the circumstances. The information alleges not only that the defendant committed the crimes of first degree intentional homicide, but also that the defendant did so while using a dangerous weapon. Dangerous weapon means any device or instrumentality which, in the manner it is used or intended to be used, is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. Great bodily harm means serious bodily injury. If you find the defendant guilty of a count of first degree intentional homicide, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Before you may answer this question, yes, you must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime of first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon. If you are not so satisfied, you must answer the question, no. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of first degree intentional homicide have been proved as to count one, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count one. If you find the defendant guilty of count one, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of first degree intentional homicide have been proved as to count two, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count two. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count two. If you find the defendant guilty of count two, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime a first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of first degree intentional homicide have been proved as to count three, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count three. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count three. If you find the defendant guilty of count three, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of first degree intentional homicide have been proved as to count four, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count four. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count four. If you find the defendant guilty of count four, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of first degree intentional homicide have been proved as to count five, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count five. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count five. If you find the defendant guilty of count five, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of first degree intentional homicide have been proved as to count six, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count six. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count six. If you find the defendant guilty of count six, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? The defendant is charged with 61 separate counts of first degree recklessly endangering safety, use of a dangerous weapon. The seventh count of the information in this case charges that 
Daryl E. Brooks on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021 on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Nicole White under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The eighth count of the information in this case charges that Darrell E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Eleanor Anders under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The ninth count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Sasha Catalan Castillo under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 10th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Maura Gilchrist under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 11th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, <laughs> did recklessly endanger the safety of Justin Gullickson under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 12 count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Harry Guilfoy under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 13th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Aiden Lof Lofgren under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 14th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Theo Maza under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 15th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Tyler Pudliner under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 16th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, 
could recklessly endanger the safety of Connor Tank under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 17th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Eric Teagues under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 18th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Adelia Mafioli under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, <coughs> Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 19th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Kelly Graybow <laughs> under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 20th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Josh Craner under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 21st count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Riley Rogers under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 22nd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Caden Rogers under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 23rd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Tucker Sparks under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 24th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Isabella Bartelt under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 25th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Yaretsi Becerra Montez 
under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 26th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, <coughs> on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Samantha Coelho under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 27th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Madison Hollingsworth under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 28th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Mackenzie Hollingsworth under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 29th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Mitchell Lampine under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 <coughs> sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 30th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Kathleen Peelmeyer under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 31st count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Julia Schleichow under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 32nd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Olivia Stover under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 33rd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Jennifer Stover under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941 0.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 34th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Jessalyn Torres 
under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 35th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Alice Urell under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 36th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Charlotte Urell under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. <clears throat> the 37th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Vivian Urell under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 38th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, <clears throat> did recklessly endanger the safety of Grace and Urell under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. <clears throat> The 39th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Lola Hospital under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 40th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, <clears throat> on Main Street, in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Tamara Rosentrader under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 40th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, sorry, the 41st count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Betty Strang under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 42nd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Maria Alvarez Dominguez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 43rd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, 
on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Georgia Romalia Perez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 44th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Elliot Hallmark under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 45th count of the information in this case charges that Darrell E. Brooks on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021 on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha <coughs> County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Benjamin Hallmark under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 46th count of the information in this case charges that Darrell E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Patrick Heppy under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 47th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Lori Loken under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 48th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Marisol Lopez Gutierrez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 49th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Adair Lopez Rebelar under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 50th count of the information in this case charges that <coughs> Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Juan Marquez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to section 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 51st count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of David Marquez. under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 53rd count of the information in this case charges that Darrell E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, 
on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Jason Petchloff under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 54th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Margaret Pachulis under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 55th count of the, inf of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Yamalette Perales Alvarez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 56th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Alin Perales Alvarez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 56th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl Lee Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Ashley Perales Alvarez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 58th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Jose Perales Alvarez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 59th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Maria Perez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 60th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Camilla Perez Gonzalez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 61st count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Isaac Foglia under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, Contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 62nd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about <coughs> Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Deborah Ramirez under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon. Contrary to sections 
three zero sub one, nine thirty nine point five zero sub three sub F, and nine thirty nine point six three sub one sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The sixty third count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November twenty one of twenty twenty one, on Main Street, in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Charles Green under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 64th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Lily Green under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 65th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, to recklessly endanger the safety of Brindley Harris under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 66th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Kelsey Knapp under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The 67th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did recklessly endanger the safety of Owen Rossiati under circumstances which show utter disregard for human life and while using a dangerous weapon, contrary to sections 941.30 sub 1, 939.50 sub 3 sub F, and 939.63 sub 1 sub B of the Wisconsin statutes. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty to each one of these charges which means the state must prove every element of each offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm going to take a quick stand break. Please stand, everyone. Thank you. Be seated. First degree recklessly endangering safety as defined in section 941.30 sub 1 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin is committed by one who recklessly endangers the safety of another human being under circumstances that show utter disregard for human life. Before you may find the defendant guilty of any count of first degree recklessly endangering safety, <coughs> the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following three elements were present with respect to that count. One, as to each count, the defendant endangered the safety of another human being. Two, as to each count, the defendant endangered the safety of another by criminally reckless conduct. Criminally reckless conduct means the conduct created a risk of death or great bodily harm to another person and the risk of death or great bodily harm was unreasonable and substantial and the defendant was aware that his conduct <coughs> created the unreasonable and substantial risk of death or great bodily harm. Great bodily harm means injury which creates a substantial risk of death <coughs> or which causes serious permanent disfigurement or which causes a permanent or protracted loss 
or impairment of the function of any bodily member or organ or other serious bodily injury. Three, as to each count, the circumstances of the defendant's conduct showed utter disregard for human life. In determining whether the circumstances of the conduct showed utter disregard for human life, consider these factors, what the defendant was doing, why the defendant was engaged in that conduct, how dangerous the conduct was, how obvious the danger was, whether the conduct showed any regard for life, and all other facts and circumstances relating to the conduct. <clears throat> the information alleges not only that the defendant committed the crimes of first degree recklessly endangering safety, but also that the defendant did so while using a dangerous weapon. Dangerous weapon means any device or instrumentality which in the manner in it is used or intended to be used is likely to produce death or great bodily harm. Great bodily harm means serious bodily injury. If you find the defendant guilty of a count of first degree recklessly endangering safety, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Before you may answer this question, yes, you must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon. If you are not so satisfied, you must answer the question, no. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count seven, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count seven. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count seven. If you find the defendant guilty of count seven, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count eight, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count eight. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count eight. If you find the defendant guilty of count eight, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved <coughs> as to count nine, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count nine. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count nine. If you find the defendant guilty of count nine, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 10, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 10. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 10. If you find the defendant guilty of count 10, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 11, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 11. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 11. If you find the defendant guilty of count 11, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 12, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 12. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 12. If you find the defendant guilty of count 12, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 13, 
you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 13. <coughs> if you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 13. If you find the defendant guilty of count 13, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 14, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 14. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 14. If you find the defendant guilty of count 14, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 15, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 15. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 15. If you find the defendant guilty of count 15, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 16, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 16. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 16. If you find the defendant guilty of count 16, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 17, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 17. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 17. If you find the defendant guilty of count 17, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 18, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 18. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 18. If you find the defendant guilty of count 18, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 19, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 19. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 19. If you find the defendant guilty of count 19, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 20, you should find the defendant guilty <coughs> of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 20. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 20. If you find the defendant guilty of count 20, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 21, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 21. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 21. If you find the defendant guilty of count 21, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 22, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 22. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 22. 
If you find the defendant guilty of count 22, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied me under reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 23, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 23. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 23. If you find the defendant guilty of count 23, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 24, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 24. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 24. If you find the defendant guilty of count 24, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 25, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 25. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 25. If you find the defendant guilty of count 25, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 26, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 26. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 26. If you find the defendant guilty of count 26, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 27, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 27. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 27. If you find the defendant guilty of count 27, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 28, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 28. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 28. If you find the defendant guilty of count 28, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 29, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 29. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 29. If you find the defendant guilty of count 29, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 30, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 30. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 30. If you find the defendant guilty of count 30, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 31, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 31. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 31. If you find the defendant guilty of count 31, you must answer the following question, yes or no. 
did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 32, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 32. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 32. If you find the defendant guilty of count 32, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 33, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 33. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 33. If you find the defendant guilty of count 33, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 34, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 34. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 34. If you find the defendant guilty of count 34, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 35, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 35. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 35. If you find the defendant guilty of count 35, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 36, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 36. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 36. If you find the defendant guilty of count 36, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 37, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 37. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 37. If you find the defendant guilty of count 37, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 38, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 38. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 38. If you find the defendant guilty of count 38, you must answer the following question, yes or no. <laughs> Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 39, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 39. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 39. If you find the defendant guilty of count 39, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 40, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 40. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 40. If you find the defendant guilty of count 40, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? 
If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 41, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 41. If you find the defendant guilty of count 41, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 42, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 42. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 42. If you find the defendant guilty of count 42, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? I've read 41 pages thus far. I am going to take a short comfort break and uh, we'll come back in about 10, 15 minutes. This will also give the jurors and the parties a chance to have a comfort break as well. All rise for the jury. AM, um, but I will address that when I get back on the record. We are in recess.
audio on? Audio. All right, cool. Okay. All right, we are back on the record. Um, the jury has not been brought out just yet. I indicated I would address um, a note that was passed by Mr. Brooks to the court. Um, in it, he indicates the following, I have reclaimed my rights, parenthesis, that I never gave up or consented to give up, parenthesis, to be present, and you have not honored your oath of office to protect my constitutional rights, specifically my 14th Amendment, Section 1, which references equal protection of the laws. <coughs> would you like to explain this on the record, or should I? I will if you won't. I would like to make an offer of proof for my appeal on the record. Um, I indicated previously that should Mr. Brooks want to come back into this courtroom pursuant to Illinois versus Allen, he could certainly reclaim the right to be present, but he would need to be willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concept of courts and judicial proceedings. I specifically advise that he would need to pledge to not interrupt the proceedings. Um, he has not done that, meaning he has not indicated he wants to come back or that he will pledge to be courteous and follow the rules of decorum and specifically pledge to not interrupt as I read through the jury instructions. Um, and his letters or notes that he passed uh, will of course be made part of the record, but I'm going to deny his request to make a further record for appeal as I need to continue advising the jury uh, of the jury instructions. So with that, uh, Mr. Brooks will remain where he is at. Um, anything further he wants to address, he will need to do that in writing uh, as he has done with a note, but I don't feel the need to give him any additional opportunity to explain that. Um, what I will ask is, is he going to make a request to come back into this courtroom? And if that is true, he can give me a thumbs up sign and then I will address that. All right, I will unmute him. Mr. Brooks, what is your request as it relates to coming back into this courtroom? I've requested to come back into the courtroom with the first, the first uh, writing that you said I had to write. I put that on the record already, sir. You did not pledge to uh, respect the rules of de courtesy and decorum and pledge to not interrupt the court. Are you willing to pledge that at this time? Your Honor, with all due respect, I've never had to do that before to reclaim my right. I've always asked when you've given me the opportunity, when I felt that the time was right, I've always asked to come back, have I not? Mr. I Brooks, asked, uh, given your conduct this morning and your blatant violation of my direct order to you to not interrupt when the jury was being brought out, I felt it important to strictly enforce uh, the language of Illinois versus Allen um, and only bring you back if you are willing to conduct yourself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concepts of courts and judicial proceedings and specifically pledge to not interrupt as I uh, go through all of these jury instructions. If you're willing to do that, I will bring you back in. Your Honor, with all due respect, can we at least be fair and say today hasn't been uh, as volatile as other days or as the the back and forth between you and I ha hasn't been uh, what it has been previously? Mr. Brooks, we started the advisement to the jury an hour later than I anticipated, so I would thoroughly disagree with you that it might not have been volatile or, or loud, but it was nonetheless disruptive. So. I will ask Your you Honor. these questions, sir. Are, if you come back into this courtroom, are you willing to honor my request and order to you that you not interrupt as I read through the jury instructions? Yeah, I, I don't understand the, the question that you're asking. Sir, and are you willing why? to refrain from raising the issue of subject matter jurisdiction if you come back into this courtroom? Your Honor, with all due respect to your ruling on Illinois versus Allen, that was not part of Illinois versus Allen. I don't understand why that's 
being Mr. Made Brooks, I'm not going to debate the meaning of Illinois versus uh, Illinois v. Allen with you. I'm simply trying to get you back into this courtroom. You seem to want to be here, but you don't want to pledge to follow the rules of courtesy and decorum. So that's on you. Your, Your Honor, this this is never been done before. It's never been done before, and I've always been able to reclaim my right to be able to be present. Are you willing? Which, which is what I stated uh, when I first came over here. I, I've been stating the same thing. I've actually told the bailiff numerous times. Mr. Brooks, I am strictly enforcing the language of Illinois versus Allen, which says the following. I will repeat myself again. Once lost, the right to be present can, of course, be reclaimed as soon as the defendant is willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concept of courts and judicial proceedings. I have uh, not required the pledge previously. I've allowed you to come back, uh, but given the interruptions this morning and your immediate discussion of things like subject matter jurisdiction and my oath the minute one juror walked through that door, I cannot take that I will not bring you back in without that pledge. So where does it say anything about a pledge, Your Honor? Sir, I'm not going to debate the language with you. I am establishing what I believe is a reasonable restriction on your right to come back into this courtroom based upon the history in this case of your repeated violations of the simple rules of courtesy and decorum and your failure to follow my very clear and direct uh, requirement this morning that you not interrupt the um, reading of the jury instructions and you be silent once the jury entered the courtroom. I did that in part because it not only preserves the dignity and decorum of this trial, it also frankly protects your rights and it minimizes your bad behavior in front of the jury. Your Honor, no, I, didn't, I didn't interrupt you while you were talking. I'll let you make your record without talking over you or interrupting. Thank you. I will I would the, agree with you just now. The way the way that I'm interpreting when you reference to me with the Illinois versus Allen where your ruling is coming from, the way that I interpret that is not the way that you're saying it to me now. That's why I don't understand the, what you're asking. I'm I'm interpreting that in a, in a totally different way. Um, I'd refer you to the third section of Illinois versus Allen where the U.S. Supreme Court was discussing what the trial court did in that case and it said the following, the trial court in this case decided under the circumstances to remove the defendant from the courtroom and to continue his trial in his absence until and unless he promised to conduct himself in a manner befitting an American courtroom. As we have said earlier, we find nothing unconstitutional about this procedure. So that is the authority, sir, in addition to the other uh, quotation. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll give you one more opportunity, sir. You can come back into this courtroom, but I do not want you to address or attempt to address subject matter jurisdiction or any of the other rulings that I've previously made. I need to continue with the advisement to this jury about the rules that govern their deliberations. That is the stage we are at. And if you violate that in any way by raising any of those legal issues in their presence, that will be in direct violation of the requirement for you to reclaim your right and you will be removed back to the other courtroom. Did you hear me say that, sir? I'm informed, but Your Honor, now you have to, you have to, you just stated on the record if I raise these issues in their presence, but if they're not in the courtroom, it's not in their presence, correct? Sir, I can't bring them into the courtroom until you're here. I expect you during that short interval not to raise these legal issues that I've already addressed multiple times. So yes, I'm telling you, if you come back into this courtroom, I don't even want to have you raise any of those issues. I want to bring the jury right out without interruption. That is my clear expectation, whether they are the jury's in the courtroom or not. Your Honor, that's now I'm I'm not I'm confused because you just said don't raise any issues in their presence, and now you're I'm I'm confused. I don't. I, 
because you're indicating to me by your statement that you intend to raise them once you get back into this courtroom. And so I'm making that another restriction and you need to pledge to me that you will not do that. Your Honor, the way that I'm interpreting what you just read to me from the other section that you just read from Illinois v. Allen, it does not have that language. So I'm, I'm Mr. Brooks, not I'm not going to debate the language. Do you want to come back in here or not? I've stated, I've stated numerous times that I shouldn't even have been brought over here anyway and that I wanted to come back. But now there's been, what I don't understand about it, Your Honor, is that there be, there's been uh, rules in, in, enforced. Mr. On Brooks, do you want to, to come, come back. back in here or not? It's a very simple I question. I said yes already. All right, How many then times I'm do going. I have to say the same thing? Because then you go on and make other statements, and then I can't because even effectuate your request. But I'm trying. I'm trying to tell you how I'm interpreting what you're saying to me. If, if you want, Mr. Me, Brooks, want I'm going to, to mute informed. you. We're going to go in recess. He can be brought back over. But I will advise you that if you start back in, even outside the presence of this jury, with any of the legal issues I've already ruled on, I'm not. A, you will go back to the other courtroom. It's that simple. So we'll be in recess. He'll be brought back over, and then we'll start back up.
you know what he's doing? The record appearances are as they were before. Um, the record should reflect that Mr. Brooks remains in the other courtroom despite what I thought was he made clear he wanted to be here. Um, he's, my understanding is he um, is now saying he doesn't understand what this court wants. I've made it very clear, I believe, what this court's expectation is that um, I continue with the jury instructions without interruption that Mr. Brooks follow um, the rules of courtesy and decorum. Um, he's had those for quite some time and that he conduct himself uh, consistently with the dignity and decorum that these proceedings deserve. And that includes not interrupting um, or bringing up legal matters that this court has previously ruled on. Um, we have lost a significant amount of time now addressing or not even addressing, but Mr. Brooks really interrupting the flow and the proceedings uh, based upon his responses, and then he attempts to engage with this court on the meaning, for example, of Illinois versus Allen. Um, he needs to make a very clear statement to this court, not an ambiguous one, but a very clear one, that he wants to come back into this courtroom and that he's uh, willing to conduct himself appropriately. And until he does that, um, he will continue to forfeit his right to be present in this courtroom as I instruct the jury. So with that, um, I did give him five minutes. I said, you have five minutes to decide. I set a timer. It went off. He is still in the other courtroom. We are going to continue. So the jury is to be brought out. And they can hear us fine. <laughs> and Madam Clerk confirmed that the audio and video is working just fine. I should further indicate he continues to be muted uh, so as there are not interruptions. And he, if he wants to address something with the court, he needs to put it, uh, write it on his pad of paper, um, and I will address it at the appropriate time. What time did, did, he, did the jurors go out? I just want to put on the record that at 11.01 I took the break. It's now 11.48. So it's, I intended to take 10, 15 minutes tops. And Mr. Brooks, you can write it down. I'm not going to interrupt further. The jury's coming out. All right. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated.
Continuing on then with the jury instructions, if you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 43, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 43. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 43. If you find the defendant guilty of count 43, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 44, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 44. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 44. If you find the defendant guilty of count 44, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 45, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 45. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 45. If you find the defendant guilty of count 45, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 46, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 46. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 46. If you find the defendant guilty of count 46, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 47, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 47. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 47. If you find the defendant guilty of count 47, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 48, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 48. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 48. If you find the defendant guilty of count 48, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have improved as to count 49, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 49. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 49. If you find the defendant guilty of count 49, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree reckless endangering safety have been proved as to count 50, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 50. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 50. If you find the defendant guilty of count 50, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 51, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 51. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 51. If you find the defendant guilty of count 51, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 52, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 52. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 52. If you find the defendant guilty of count 52, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? 
If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 53, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 53. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 53. <clears throat> If you find the defendant guilty of count 53, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 54, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 54. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 54. If you find the defendant guilty of count 54, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree, recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 55, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 55. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 55. If you find the defendant guilty of count 55, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree, recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 56, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 56. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 56. If you find the defendant guilty of count 56, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree, recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 57, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 57. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 57. If you find the defendant guilty of count 57, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 58, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 58. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 58. If you find the defendant guilty of count 58, you must answer the following question, yes or no. <coughs> Did the defendant commit the crime a first degree recklessly endangering safety by using a dangerous weapon. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 59, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 59. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 59. If you find the defendant guilty of count 59, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree, recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 60, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 60. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 60. If you find the defendant guilty of count 60, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable <coughs> doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 61, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 61. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 61. If you find the defendant guilty of count 61, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 62, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 62. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 62. 
If you find the defendant guilty of count 62, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 63, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 63. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 63. If you find the defendant guilty of count 63, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 64, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 64. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 64. If you find the defendant guilty of count 64, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 65, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 65. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 65. If you find the defendant guilty of count 65, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree reckless endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 66, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 66. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 66. If you find the defendant guilty of count 66, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of first degree recklessly endangering safety have been proved as to count 67, you should find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 67. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 67. If you find the defendant guilty of count 67, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit the crime of first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? The defendant is charged with six separate counts of violating a duty after having been involved in an accident resulting in death. The 68th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021 on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did operate a vehicle involved in an accident that resulted in the death of Virginia Sorensen and failed to reasonably investigate what was struck and if the operator knew or had reason to know that the accident resulted in injury or death of a person and failed to stop the vehicle he was operating as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene of the accident until he did all of the following. Give his name, address, and the registration number of the vehicle he was operating to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and upon request and if available, exhibit his operator's license to the operator or occupant or of, <coughs> of or person attending any vehicle collided with <coughs> and render reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident. <coughs> including transporting or making arrangements to transport the person to a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent <coughs> that medical or surgical treatment is necessary or if requested by the injured person. Contrary to section 346.67 sub 1 and 346.74 sub 5 sub D and 939.50 sub 3 sub D of the Wisconsin statutes. <coughs> The 69th count of the information in this case charges that 
Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did operate a vehicle involved in an accident that resulted in the death of Leanna Owen and failed to reasonably investigate what was struck and if the operator knew or had reason to know that the accident resulted in injury or death of a person and failed to stop the vehicle he was operating as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene of the accident until he did all of the following. <clears throat> Give his name, address, and the registration number of the vehicle he was operating to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and upon request and if available, exhibit his operator's license to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and render reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident, including transporting or making arrangements to transport the person to a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent that medical or surgical treatment is necessary or if requested by the injured person. Contrary to section 346.67 sub 1 and 346.74 sub 5 sub D and 939.50 sub 3 sub D of the Wisconsin statutes. The 70th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021 on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did operate a vehicle involved in an accident that resulted in the death of Tamara Durand and failed to reasonably investigate what was struck and if the operator knew or had reason to know that the accident resulted in injury or death of a person and failed to stop the vehicle he was operating as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene of the accident until he did all of the following. Give his name, address, and the registration number of the vehicle he was operating to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and upon request and if available, exhibit his operator's license to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with <clears throat> and render reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident, including transporting or making arrangements to transport the person to a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent that medical or surgical treatment is necessary or if requested by the injured person. Contrary to sections 346.67 sub 1, 346.74 sub 5 sub D, and 939.50 sub 3 sub D of the Wisconsin statutes. The 71st count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did operate a vehicle involved in an accident that resulted in the death of Jane Kulik and failed to reasonably investigate what was struck and if the operator knew or had reason to know that the accident resulted in injury or death of a person and failed to stop the vehicle he was operating as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene of the accident until he did all of the following. Give his name, address, and the registration number of the vehicle he was operating to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and Upon request and if available, exhibit his operator's license to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and render reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident, including transporting or making arrangements to transport the person to a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent that medical or surgical treatment is necessary or if requested by the injured person. Contrary to sections 346.67 sub 1, 346.74 sub 5 sub D, and 939.50 sub 3 sub D of the Wisconsin statutes. The 72nd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did operate a vehicle involved in an accident that resulted in the death of Wilhelm Hospital and failed to reasonably investigate what was struck and if the operator knew or had reason to know that the vehicle, sorry, that the accident resulted in injury or death of a person <clears throat> and failed to stop the vehicle 
He was operating as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene of the accident until he did all of the following. Give his name, address, and the registration number of the vehicle he was operating to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle <coughs> collided with and upon request and if available, exhibit his operator's license to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and render reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident, including transporting or making arrangements to transport the person to a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent that medical or surgical treatment is necessary or if requested by the injured person. Contrary to sections 346.67 sub 1, 346.74 sub 5 sub D, and 939.50 sub 3 sub D of the Wisconsin statutes. The 73rd count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did operate a vehicle involved in an accident that resulted in the death of Jackson Sparks and failed to reasonably investigate what was struck and if the operator knew or had reason to know that the accident resulted in injury or death of a person and failed to stop the vehicle he was operating as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene of the accident until he did all of the following. Give his name, address, and the registration number of the vehicle he was operating to the operator of, sorry, to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and upon request and if available, exhibit his operator's license to the operator or occupant of or person attending any vehicle collided with and render reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident, including transporting or making arrangements to transport the person to a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent that medical or surgical treatment is necessary or if requested by the injured person, contrary to sections 346.67 sub 1, 346.74 sub 5, sub D, and 939.50 sub 3 sub D of the Wisconsin statutes. The defendant has entered a plea of not guilty to each of these charges which means the state must prove every element of each offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> Section 346.67 of the Wisconsin statutes, commonly referred to as hit and run, is violated when the operator of any vehicle involved in an accident on a highway fails to reasonably investigate what was struck and if the operator knows or had reason, has reason to know that the accident resulted in death of a person, fails to stop the vehicle he is operating as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene of the accident until the operator has given information and rendered reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident. Before you may find the defendant guilty of any count of hit and run, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following four elements were present with respect to that count. One, as to each count, the defendant operated a vehicle involved in an accident on a highway. A vehicle is operated when it is set in motion. Two, as to each count, the defendant knew that the vehicle he operated was involved in an accident on a highway. Three, as to each count, the defendant violated a duty after being involved in an accident. A driver who is involved in an accident has two duties. The state is required to satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant violated at least one of the two duties but you are not required to agree as to which duty was violated. The first duty is to reasonably investigate what was struck. The second duty is that a driver involved in an accident involving a person must stop and provide information and render aid. To prove a violation of this duty, 
the state must prove the following beyond a reasonable doubt. That the defendant knew or had reason to know that the vehicle he was operating was involved in an accident involving a person and that the accident resulted in death of a person and that the defendant did not immediately stop his vehicle as close to the scene of the accident as possible and remain at the scene until he had done all of the following. A, give his name, address, and the registration number of the vehicle he was driving to the person struck, and B, if it was requested and was available, exhibit his operator's license to the person struck, and C, render, rendered reasonable assistance to any person injured in the accident, including the transporting or making arrangements to transport the person to a physician, surgeon, or hospital for medical or surgical treatment if it is apparent that medical or surgical treatment is necessary or is requested by the injured person. Four, the defendant was physically capable of complying with these requirements. You cannot look into a person's mind to find knowledge. What a person knows or has reason to know must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon knowledge. The information alleges not only that the defendant committed the crimes of hit and run, but also that the accident resulted in the death to a person. If you find the defendant guilty of a count of hit and run, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident involve death to a person? Before you may answer yes, you must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the answer to that question is yes. If you are not so satisfied, you must answer the question no. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of hit and run have been proved as to count 68, you should find the defendant guilty of hit and run as charged in count 68. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. If you find the defendant guilty, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident involve death to Virginia Sorensen? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of hit and run have been proved as to count 69, you should find the defendant guilty of hit and run as charged in count 69. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. If you find the defendant guilty, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the, def did the accident involve death to Leanna Owen? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of hit and run have been proved as to count 70, you should find the defendant guilty of hit and run as charged in count 70. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. If you find the defendant guilty, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident involve death to Tamara Durand? And I will specifically address Mr. Brooks at a later point. Count 71, if you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of hit and run have been proved as to count 68, you should find the defendant guilty of hit and run as charged in count 68. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. If you find the defendant guilty, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident involve death to Jane Kulik? <clears throat> If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of hit and run have been proved as to count 72, you should find the defendant guilty of hit and run as charged in count 72. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. If you find the defendant guilty, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident involve death to Wilhelm Hospital? If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of hit and run have been proved as to count 73, you should find the defendant guilty of hit and run as charged in count 73. 
If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. If you find the defendant guilty, you must answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident involve death to Jackson Sparks? The defendant is charged with two separate counts of bail jumping. The 74th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, on Main Street in the city of Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin, having been charged with a felony and having been released from custody under Chapter 969 of the Wisconsin Statutes, did intentionally fail to comply with the terms of his bond, contrary to Section 946.49 sub 1 sub b and 939.50 sub 3 sub h of the wisconsin statutes the 75th count of the information in this case charges that daryl e brooks on or about sunday november 21 of 2021 on main street in the city of waukesha waukesha county wisconsin having been charged with a felony and having been released from custody under chapter 969 of the wisconsin statutes did intentionally fail to comply with the terms of his bond, contrary to sections 946.49 sub 1 sub b and 939.50 sub 3 sub h of the Wisconsin statutes. Bail jumping, as defined in section 946.49 sub 1 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin, is committed by one who has been released from custody on bond and intentionally fails to comply with the terms of the bond. Before you may find the defendant guilty of any count of bail jumping, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following three elements were present with respect to that count. One, as to each count, the defendant was charged with a felony. A felony is a crime punishable by imprisonment in the Wisconsin State Prisons. Two, as to each count, the defendant was released from custody on bond. This requires that after being charged, the defendant was released from custody on, excuse me, bond under conditions established by a court commissioner. Three, as to each count, the defendant intentionally failed to comply with the terms of his bond. This requires that the defendant had the mental purpose to fail to comply with the terms of his bond. This also requires that the defendant knew of the terms of the bond and knew that his actions did not comply with those terms. The defendant is charged with violating a condition of bond that required that he not commit any crime. The state alleges that the defendant committed the crimes of first degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon, first degree recklessly endangering safety use of a dangerous weapon, hit and run resulting in death and battery. The state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime of first degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon, first degree recklessly endangering safety use of a dangerous weapon, hit and run resulting in death or battery. The state is required to satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed a crime, but you are not required to agree on which one. The crimes of first degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon, first degree recklessly endangering safety use of a dangerous weapon, and hit and run resulting in death have already been defined for you and you should apply the same definition here. Battery will be defined in just a bit and you should apply that definition here as well. You cannot look into a person's mind to find intent or knowledge. Intent and knowledge must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, <laughs> words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent and knowledge.
If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of bail jumping have been proved as to count 74, you should find the defendant guilty of bail jumping as charged in count 74. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 74. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of bail jumping have been proved as to count 75, you should find the defendant guilty of bail jumping as charged in count 75. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 75. The 76th count of the information in this case charges that Daryl E. Brooks, on or about Sunday, November 21 of 2021, near Frame Park in the city of Waukesha, <coughs> Waukesha County, Wisconsin, did cause bodily harm to Erica Patterson by an act done with intent to cause bodily harm to that person without that person's consent, contrary to section 940.19 sub 1, 939.51 sub 3 sub A, and 968.075 sub 1 sub A of the Wisconsin statutes. Battery, as defined in section 940.19 sub 1 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin, is committed by one who causes bodily harm to another by an act done with intent to cause bodily harm to that person or another without the consent of the person so harmed. Before you may find the defendant guilty of battery, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the following four elements were present. One, the defendant caused bodily harm to Erica Patterson. Cause means that the defendant's act was a substantial factor in producing the bodily harm. Bodily harm means physical pain or injury, illness, or any impairment of physical condition. Two, the defendant intended to cause bodily harm to Erica Patterson. Intent to cause bodily harm means that the defendant had the mental purpose to cause bodily harm to another human being or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause bodily harm to another human being. Three, the defendant caused bodily harm without the consent of Erica Patterson. Four, the defendant knew that Erica Patterson did not consent. You cannot look into a person's mind to find intent and knowledge. Intent and knowledge must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent and knowledge. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all four elements of battery have been proved, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. I want to go back to the bail jumping because the battery is not part of that charge. And there's a, an inclusion of that in the jury instruction that I will have corrected. So I'm going to read the definition, uh, the substantive instruction on bail jumping once again, um, starting with what the charges are. Well, the charges I've already read, they will stand. So. Bail jumping, as defined in section 946.49 sub 1 of the Criminal Code of Wisconsin, is committed by one who has been released from custody on bond and intentionally fails to comply with the terms of that bond. Before you may find the defendant guilty of any count of bail jumping, the state must prove by evidence, which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt, that the following three elements were present with respect to that count. One, as to each count, the defendant was charged with a felony. A felony is a crime punishable by imprisonment in the Wisconsin State Prisons. Two, as to each count, the defendant was released from custody on bond. This requires that after being charged, the defendant was released from custody on bond under conditions established by a court commissioner. Three, as to each count, the defendant intentionally failed to comply with the terms of the bond. This requires that the defendant had the mental purpose to comply with the terms of the bond. This also requires that the defendant knew of the terms of the bond and knew that his actions did not comply with those terms. The defendant is charged with violating a condition of bond that required that he not commit any crime. 
The state alleges that the defendant committed the crimes of first-degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon, first-degree recklessly endangering safety use of a dangerous weapon, and hit and run resulting in death. The state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the crime of first-degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon, first-degree recklessly endangering safety use of a dangerous weapon, or hit and run resulting in death. The state is required to satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed a crime, but you are not required to agree on which one. The crimes of first-degree intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon, first-degree recklessly endangering safety use of a dangerous weapon, and hit and run resulting in death have already been defined for you, and you should apply the same definitions here. You cannot look into a person's mind to find intent or knowledge. Intent and knowledge must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of bail jumping have been proved as to count 74, you should find the defendant guilty of bail jumping as charged in count 74. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 74. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that all three elements of bail jumping have been proved as to count 75, you should find the defendant guilty of bail jumping as charged in count 75. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty as to count 75. An information is nothing more than a written formal accusation against a defendant charging the commission of one or more criminal acts. You are not to consider it as evidence against the defendant in any way. It does not raise any inference of guilt. The defendant has a constitutional right to represent himself. I have advised the defendant that the same rules apply whether a lawyer acts for him or he acts for himself. The defendant has decided to represent himself, and this decision must not influence your verdict in any manner. At times, Mr. Brooks has appeared from another courtroom. This must not influence your verdict in any way. In reaching your verdict, Examine the evidence with care and caution. Act with judgment, reason, and prudence. Defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with the commission of an offense to be innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless in your deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you can return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you should do so and return a verdict of not guilty. The term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence. It means such a doubt as would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which is based on mere guesswork or speculation. A doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. While it is your duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, you are not to search for doubt. You are to search for the truth. 
The identification of the defendant is an issue in this case, and you should give it your careful attention. You should consider the reliability of any identification made by a witness, whether made in or out of court. You should consider the credibility of a witness making an identification of the defendant in the same way you consider credibility of any other witness. Identification evidence involves an expression of belief or impression by the witness. Its value depends on the opportunity the witness had to observe the offender at the time of the offense and later to make a reliable identification. Consider the witness's opportunity for observation, how long the observation lasted, how close the witness was, the lighting, the mental state of the witness at the time, the physical ability of the witness to see and hear the events, and any other circumstances of the observation. You should also consider the period of time which elapsed between the witness's observation and the identification of the defendant and, enter, inter, and any intervening event which may have affected or influenced the identification. In evaluating the identification evidence, you are to consider those factors which might affect human perception and memory and all the influences and circumstances relating to the identification. Then give the evidence the weight you believe it should receive. If you find that the crime alleged was committed, before you may find the defendant guilty, you must be satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is the person who committed the crime. Evidence is, first, the sworn testimony of witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness. Second, the exhibits the court has received, whether or not an exhibit goes to the jury room. Third, any facts to which the lawyers have agreed or stipulated or which the court has directed you to find. Anything you may have seen or heard outside the courtroom is not evidence. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. It is not necessary that every fact be proved directly by a witness or an exhibit. A fact may be proved indirectly by circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence from which a jury may logically find other facts according to common knowledge and experience. Circumstantial evidence is not necessarily better or worse than direct evidence. Either type of evidence can prove a fact. Whether evidence is direct or circumstantial, it must satisfy you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the offense before you may find the defendant guilty. Evidence has been presented relating to the defendant's conduct after the alleged crime was committed. Whether the evidence shows a consciousness of guilt and whether consciousness of guilt shows actual guilt are matters exclusively for you to decide. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to a conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. While motive may be shown as a circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of a defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of a defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight you believe deserves under all of the circumstances. An exhibit becomes evidence only when received by the court. An exhibit marked for identification and not received is not evidence. An exhibit received is evidence whether or not it goes to the jury room. Parties for each side have the right and the duty to object to what they consider are improper questions asked of witnesses and to the admission of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. You should not draw any conclusions from the fact an objection was made. By allowing testimony or other evidence to be received over the objection of parties, the court is not indicating any opinion about the evidence. You jurors are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight of the evidence. Disregard entirely any question that the court did not allow to be answered. Do not guess at what the witness's answer might have been. If the question itself suggested that certain information might be true, <laughs> ignore the suggestion and do not consider it as evidence. 
During the trial, the court has ordered certain testimony to be stricken. Disregard all stricken testimony. <clears throat> the weight of evidence does not depend on the number of witnesses on each side. You may find that the testimony of one witness is entitled to greater weight than that of any other witness, sorry, than that of another witness or even of several other witnesses. Remarks of the parties are not evidence. If the remarks suggested certain facts not in evidence, disregard the suggestion. In weighing the evidence, you may take into account matters of your common knowledge and your observations and experience in the affairs of life. It is the duty of the jury to scrutinize and to weigh the testimony of witnesses and to determine the effect of the evidence as a whole. You are the sole judges of the credibility, that is, the believability of the witnesses and of the weight to be given to their testimony. In determining the credibility of each witness and the weight you give to the testimony of each witness, consider these factors. Whether the witness has an interest or lack of interest in the result of this trial. The witness's <coughs> conduct, appearance, and demeanor on the witness stand. The clearness or lack of clearness of the witness's recollections. The opportunity the witness had for observing and for knowing the matters the witness testified about. The reasonableness of the witness's testimony. The apparent intelligence of the witness. Bias or prejudice, if any has been shown possible motives for falsifying testimony, and all other facts and circumstances during the trial which tend either to support or to discredit the testimony. Then give to the testimony of each witness the weight you believe it should receive. There is no magic way for you to, there is no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony. Instead, you should use your common sense and experience. In everyday life, you determine for yourselves the reliability of things people say to you. You should do the same here. Evidence has been received that two of the witnesses in this trial have been convicted of a crime. This evidence has, sorry, was received solely because it bears upon the witness's character for truthfulness. It must not be used for any other purpose. Ordinarily, a witness may testify only about facts. However, a witness with specialized knowledge in a particular field may give an opinion in that field. In determining the weight to give to this opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness, the facts upon which the opinion is based, and the reasons given for the opinion. Opinion evidence was received to help you reach a conclusion. However, you are not bound by any witness's opinion. During the trial, a witness was told to assume certain facts and then was asked for an opinion based upon that assumption. This is called a hypothetical question. The opinion does not establish the truth of the facts upon which it is based. Consider the opinion only if you believe the assumed facts upon which it, upon which it is based have been proved. If you find that the facts stated in the hypothetical question have not been proved, then the opinion based on those facts should not be given any weight. At this time, I will reserve the instruction on closing arguments because we are going to take our lunch break and then come back after the lunch hour for closing arguments. All rise for the jury. All right, thank you. Be seated. As soon as the doors close, I just need to put a couple things on the record. Um, as I read, the doors closed, right? There we go. As I read through the bail jumping, it dawned on me that the battery should not be referenced because the battery was not on Main Street. And so I took it out um, because the way that the charge and the information reads, and we had that discussion preliminarily, which is why later on it doesn't reference the instruction for battery. So I cleaned that up 
by rereading it and taking that out. So I wanted to make a record of that. Um, obviously, I will need to have uh, a new set made that has that uh, correction. Um, and I apologize for not catching that previously. Um, but obviously, I caught that as I read it. Um, there was one other heading that said preliminary on, I think it was instruction 70. I need to cross that out. Um, and I think I found the word A or A, depending on how you say it, missing from one thing. I'm going to add that in, and I'll, and I'll have that for the parties. And then uh, I did note that at approximately 12.19, um, it may have been a little bit earlier than that, but I noticed Mr. Brooks was waving his hands. At one point, I did indicate I would address that at a later point in time. Um, I'm aware, I am aware of a number of filings. Um, I addressed two of them previously, but there are two additional. Um, I am going to have copies made of all of these filings for the state uh, so that they have an opportunity to review them. Um, from my perspective, just briefly, um, he is making some objections to what I am doing, but at no time in those did he ask uh, to be brought back to the courtroom, and certainly within those he did not pledge to follow the um, basic tenets of courtesy and decorum. Um, given where I was at in the proceedings with the reading of the preliminary instructions and given the court's prior uh, finding that he had forfeited his right to be present, um, I thought it important to get through the reading of the instructions up until the point of the closing argument instruction, which I reserved because I'll uh, review that with the jury when they come back prior to the parties being given their opportunity to give closing arguments. Um, I will also be advising Mr. Brooks that given that um, I'm moving on to a second part of this, that being the closing arguments. He uh, will be uh, invited back into the courtroom here for those closing arguments, of course, subject to um, his conduct. Um, I expect that he will follow the rules of courtesy and decorum um, and also not raise legal issues in front of the jury um, when they are here. With that, um, we will take our lunch recess. Um, it's 1247. I will take an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you, everyone.
And yesterday, too, you got to scan that in, too. Okay. And then, do you have the sheets for me? Um, the yellow. Mm -hmm. And yellow. His yellow sheets. Yes. Isn't there a fourth one? There's one on your head, but on your face. Yeah. Hey, hey. Thank you. All right, it's 2 o'clock. I'll call the case. State of Wisconsin versus Daryl Brooks. Case number 21CF 1848 may have the appearances, please. Good afternoon, Judge Slapper, Leslie Daisy, and Zach Wachow appearing for the state. <coughs> I'm here without, without prejudice by special appearance. Beneficiary, I'm here under fraud, menace, duress, and extortion. Judiciary, Jennifer R. Girl. This is a social security says the Q trust action, which you are a real party in interest to. As sujurist and propria, propria persona, this is a military admiralty tribunal and maritime law and the title for the United States Code Section 1, which you can see which states placing a fringe on a national flag is within discretion of presidential president acting as commander in chief of the army and navy. Is this uh, a common law court or an admiralty court? The records reflect that the individual known to this court as Daryl Brooks is present in person in custody. He is wearing a dress shirt. Um, I know he has a suit coat, but it's not on. He's also wearing a mask. The court is not going to address any of the issues that he is raising as they are meritless. Um, and uh, the, I would also say the same as to the uh, notes that he passed while he was in the other courtroom. Um, for the record, I did provide a copy of all of those to the state as well. They are also uploaded into the file and are made part of the record to the extent that he raises objections or lack of consent and is noted for the record. I was about to do that and say that I don't consent to being called that name or identity. That is the trust name and it is not me myself. I don't recognize that name nor do I consent to being called by that name. With all respect, Your Honor. And we still have yet to address subject matter jurisdiction, which has yet to be proven on the record. Um, he is May I receive those original copies time stamped? Okay. All right, I need to uh, make a record of one part of a jury instruction that I do need to advise the jury. It will also be corrected in the packet. Um, I believe within the last year, the jury instruction on credibility of witnesses was modified by the jury instruction committee. And it was just an oversight on the court's part to not include, it's really just one paragraph. It was read to the jury at the beginning of the case with the preliminary instructions, uh, but it is a paragraph regarding implicit bias. And so I do think it's important to advise the jury of that. I intend to do that when they come out. And then again, uh, the full instruction will be amended so that it's in the packet that goes to the jury. Um, and Madam Clerk, if you haven't already, if you could print off page 72. It's the, um, it adds a paragraph before the last paragraph that starts with there is no magic way for you to evaluate the testimony um, and again, I wanted to be consistent with the most recent version of the jury instructions and consistent with what was instructed or provided to the jurors uh, at the beginning of the case. And so I will make sure that they have that and so advise them when they come out. Um, also, I will read instruction 160, closing arguments. Um, Madam Clerk, if you could just make the change so that it's of parties. Um, we, we've missed that. Uh, correction as well. So it's the closing arguments of the parties, not the attorneys. And so I will just make that correction and make sure it's. I accept the value and return for value this document. And Your Honor, I requested that I have 
uh, copies of my filings from earlier, time stamped. Uh, Mr. Brooks, I'll provide you with uh, the copies later on. I need to continue with the instructing of the jury and have the parties make their closing arguments. Your Honor, with all I respect, did. the state received copies. How come I can't receive the copies of my filings? You know what? We'll give, I can give you the print-offs, but I can't give you the originals right now. I, that's what I'm referring to, and you will absolutely get those back. Um, I, I guess I was mistaken that you wrote copy on it. I thought you retained a copy for your records. So with that, Madam Clerk will print off from the record. It won't be the yellow copies just yet. I'll take that up later outside the presence of the jury after the case has been given to them. Now in terms of the closing arguments, um, I did set a time limit for the parties yesterday. Each side will have a total of one hour. Um, Mr. Brooks, so that you are fully aware, the party with the burden of proof, which is the state of Wisconsin, goes first. Then you, as the opposing party, will have an opportunity to respond and argue. And then time limit willing, the state also has the opportunity to present rebuttal uh, because they have the burden of proof. And that is provided with the um, excerpt from the bench book that was provided to you yesterday. It has uh, the purpose of the closing arguments is to summarize the facts, marshal arguments, focus the issues for the jury. I just talked about the order of the arguments. Um, the scope of the arguments are the content, duration, and form of argument are within the court's discretion. That's why I set a time limit of one hour for the parties. Um, and Mr. Brooks, I will advise you that I certainly will wait and see uh, how you present your argument today. I will certainly wait to see if there are any um, objections raised, but I also want you to be aware that if I feel the arguments are improper, I may simply, without an objection, say, please move on as a clear indication from this court that um, what you are stating is not proper um, under the various rules and case law that govern um, closing arguments. Again, Your Honor, without prejudice, I'm here by special appearance. I don't consent to being called that name for the record. It's noted, sir. All right, then with that, I will have the jur Oh, go, uh, looks like Attorney Upper has some issues she wants to raise. Yes, I just have one question, Your Honor. Would I have permission to put the easel up and display some of the poster boards I did confer with uh, Captain Dussault as far as security is concerned, and he agreed to it if the court would give me that uh, authority. Where would it be displayed? He's going to put it like right here, and then you want me standing at this table during I the do. Day. Yes. So I would just position it like right here. Um, and I don't have to leave it up through the whole thing. I realize it blocks the view of, uh, of people in the courtroom. Detective Casey would be willing to assist me in, in removing them when I'm done with them, if that's okay with you. I trust it won't block Mr. Brooks' view of the jury. And that's as long right. as yeah, that, I was going to put it like right about here so that he could still see me and the jury. With that caveat, yes, I will allow that. All right. Objection. What is that? What is supposed to be put up? Uh, admitted, Your Honor, it's Exhibit 15 and 130, I believe. So are they exhibits? I'm, I'm confused to what they are. Mr. Brooks, I've made a ruling. Uh, the state has made a request. I've granted it. Yeah, but I'm, In terms I'm saying of I don't understand what, what's being shown. Should not have the right to ask, uh, to object and ask what it is that's actually going to be shown? The state's put on the record what it is. It's a, it is, they, or I should say, they are exhibits that have previously been received by the court during the course of this trial that is proper for a party to do that during its closing arguments. So can I put up exhibits? Um, Mr. Brooks, I don't know what you have planned for your closing argument. Uh, so I'm, I'm making a request, the same request. May I be able to put up uh well, exhibits. I guess it depends on what it is, sir. So I'm not going to take up any more time because what I intend to do is um, once the state 
goes through its closing. I may take just a short comfort break depending on how long it is. Um, and if there's something in particular, what are you, you will need to tell me what it is. As long as it's an exhibit from this case, then I don't, I wouldn't have an issue with it. it they would be from this case, obviously. It's just not nothing that the state had. I'm not aware of exhibits that the state wouldn't have that you would have. Everything that's been received, we have a list. Um, so if it's not something that was received during this trial as an exhibit by the court, unless you tell me what it is so that I can make a ruling, um, I, I can't see how it would be relevant or appropriate for your closing argument. They're uh, part of my filings that you filed. The filings have no relevance to the issues that are before the jury. The closing arguments are to direct the jury so that they have your arguments so that when they go back to determine the issues in this case, which are related to whether you're guilty or not guilty of the 76 charges, um, things like subject matter jurisdiction or uh, like that would not be something that would be proper before this jury. Those are legal issues that the court would decide. The jury is the judge of the facts. The court is the judge of the law. That's I'm why I have all of these jury instructions to give to the jury. I'm not referring to subject matter jurisdiction. What are you referring to then? Be very specific so I'm, I can make a finding and rule. I was specific. Uh, my other filings that That's was not filed. specific enough, my, sir. What are you referring my court, to? Dr. Which Sheen, filing? My, let me know when you're done, Your Honor. Which filing, sir? Not generally, but specifically. Are you done? Are you done? Sir, that's very rude and disrespectful. No, I'm just, I didn't know if you was finna say something. I that's why I'm asking, are you done? Which, ex what filing Your Honor, are how you come every to? time I try, even when I try to err on the side of caution, you, you find some <laughs> way to make it to be something that it's not? I didn't know if you was gonna say something else. I've asked a question, sir, so when I do that, I would hope it would convey to you I'm looking for an answer. So which filing are you referring to? All my filings, all my filings, my my uh, my notice of appearance, my statement of particulars, my bond, the court docket sheet, all of those filings. The request to display those to the jury is denied. It's not relevant. How is it not relevant? Not even your That's oath of office? That's my determination, sir. So I'll take, I am going to start this. Not even your oath of office can be shown? No, that is not relevant to these proceedings, sir. It is. It's not relevant in front of the jury. Why is it not relevant? Can you? Mr. Brooks. Can you explain you why that's not relevant? You are not going to be able to raise those types of issues and present a closing argument based upon my oath of office, whether I'm licensed to practice law in the state of Wisconsin. I said your uh, oath of office, I didn't say jurisdiction, anything. Whether you consent to this appearance or not, none of those things help the jury determine the issues in this case, which are related to whether you are guilty or not guilty of the 76 charges that have the been jury, the jury filed should in know this that case. They should know the truth in their duties, in their rights. They should know that at least. Mr. Brooks, I'm putting you on notice that if you continue with this um, insistence upon presenting information that's not properly before the jury as evidence in this case, that I will instruct you during your closing argument to move on and potentially ask the jury have the jury leave so that I can admonish you. And if you keep insisting on that, sir, that will be a, in direct violation of the court's direction. So they you. can't even, they can't even know that I got a shock device on my ankles. They absolutely do not need to know that. Why so it's not? not relevant to the determinations of guilt or innocence in this it's case. It's the truth. Mr. Brooks, your custodial status is not on trial here. Uh, I will no, argue that it is. conduct from November 21st of 2021 is That hasn't been trial. proven. You may not bring up your, the way that you've been shackled. It's not relevant, sir. It's and if you truth. do so, you do it at your peril. But it's, here's there, the thing, there is the no jury peril. is specific. It's my right, no, though. Let me, let me go. Okay. It's my constitutional is, right. 
just like there under so the First Amendment, that, which yeah. I preserved the, my First Amendment right when I came in this morning, I also preserved my right. Sixth Brooks, Amendment right. Please stop. You do not have an unfettered First Amendment right. That is very clear based upon. What do you all mean by unfettered? Law. What do you mean by unfettered? It I means don't. It is not absolute. It can be restricted. So the Constitution of the United States can be constricted. All right. Mr. Brooks, I'm putting you on notice that if you continue with your insistence on raising issues that are I'm going to raise issues that the jury needs to are, know. They're not regardless issues. because they're 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 under the rights of the United States Constitution, Mr. which Brooks, is the I law of the land. Your attention to closing instruction four six. I'm going. I'm going to let the jury point. know the truth. Their their duty and their rights under the First Amendment and under the Sixth Amendment. I have the right to inform them of their rights, of the truth, and of their duties under the First Amendment and under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of these United States. You can't, no state law can override that. Mr. Any Brooks, law, do you any to law keep this repugnant. Up when the jury comes out, Your because Honor, I need to no, have I do the not. State That's why I'm addressing this before they before they come out. That's why I'm trying to address this before they come out. So it doesn't become an issue once they're in here. But under the First Amendment and under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, which are rights that I preserved the moment we stepped in here this morning when this proceedings started, I preserved those rights for the record. And now you're telling me that those rights are not, would you say, unfettered? or I don't know what you say. I don't even know what that means. I don't, I don't even understand that. But any law repugnant of the United States Constitution is null and void. Mr. Brooks, I'm putting you on notice that you can also uh, forfeit by your conduct the right to present a closing argument. In appropriate circumstances, um, the right to present a closing argument, no different than the right to testify, may be subject to forfeiture where your conduct is incompatible with the assertion of the right at issue. The goals that this court has attempted to follow throughout this proceeding are multifaceted and multifold. Uh, number one, I do have an obligation and I have done my best to ensure that this is a fair trial. However, a fair trial does not mean a defendant has unfettered rights to state whatever he wants, when he wants. Uh, this court, not only through the course of the trial, uh, is deemed with the responsibility to control the presentation of evidence to as to ensure fairness and reliability of the criminal trial process. Um, it also includes uh, ensuring that the closing arguments are relevant, are appropriate. Um, this court must also uh, be concerned with efficiency and effectiveness and of course, last but not least, courtesy and decorum in this courtroom what I would generally refer to as civility in the courtroom. Um, you do not have unfettered First Amendment rights or an unfettered Sixth Amendment right, sir. Um, you must conform your conduct to the rules of decorum, the rules of evidence, and the rules of procedure. While you have a right to present relevant and probative arguments to this jury, uh, you may not, and you may not present arguments related to such things as jury nullification, subject matter jurisdiction, the court's oath or lack thereof, if that's what you believe, whether this court is a court of common law, admiralty, all of those things relate to your claim as being a sovereign, which are frankly baseless, they're meritless, they've been debunked by many courts, including the court uh, in the Benneby decision that's been referenced by this court previously. I will give you a fair opportunity to present a closing argument, but again, it is not unfettered. The simple fact is, sir, this court can restrict your right to present a closing argument. This court has the authority under 90611, <clears throat> under the various cases, uh, including Illinois versus Allen, including Rock versus Arkansas, although Rock versus Arkansas and uh, Chambers versus Mississippi dealt with the right to testify, um, there is a decision, uh, I looked it up earlier, and I'll just pull it up and tell you the case site so that, we, so that you have it. 
I would direct your attention to Herring versus New York, found at 422 U.S. 853, a 1975 case, although in a footnote, um, it Herring, does stand Herring for the proposition that a defendant who has exercised the right to conduct his own defense has, of course, the same right to make a closing argument. That's quoting State uh, Ferretta versus California, or following the same logic from uh, Rock and Anthony and Chambers, uh, a right, even a constitutional right that a defendant has uh, may be forfeited by conduct. This court uh, just like it attempted to do with regard to your right to testify and set up reasonable restrictions so as to uh, meet all of the goals that the court needs to meet um, are as will be as follows and that is again sir you may not bring up um, matters that are not relevant to the determination of guilt or innocence that means evidence that was not presented and not received in this courtroom is not relevant to your closing arguments. Um, it's not, uh, the arguments must be based on the law, not as you interpret the law, but as the law is. You must base your closing arguments on the facts that have been established during this case, meaning the evidence, the testimony, um, as I indicated earlier, the, the purpose of a closing argument is to summarize the facts, marshal arguments, and focus the issues for the jury. Uh, it is fair that you comment on evidence, including arguing evidence to the conclusion or inference. Um, it is your ability or your opportunity to convince the jury that you are not guilty of these offenses. Um, you may not convey any idea that you have undisclosed information. Neither party may vouch for a witness or otherwise express personal belief or opinion regarding truth or falsity of any testimony or evidence. Um, it, is, it would be improper to ask a jury to draw inferences that the parties know are not true. And your comments on evidence is limited to evidence in the case. You may not comment on facts outside the record or peculiarly within your own knowledge. Um, and, and that is just some of the guidelines for determining the proprietary of arguments that I am guided by from my judicial bench book and all of the cases that are referenced therein. So you are put on notice, sir, that even without an objection, this court may, in an effort to preserve the dignity, the decorum, and to keep the issues properly before the jury, may advise you during your closing argument to move on. If you do not honor the court's rulings, then you will run the risk of forfeiting your right to be present and potentially forfeiting your right to further present your closing argument. With that, I am bringing this jury out to complete the instructions that I need to complete to add to the credibility uh, instruction, the paragraph on implicit bias, and to let them know the full instructions that they receive will have it, to read 160 closing arguments of the parties, and then to have the state go first as they bear the burden of proof. Now, Your Honor, I'll just let you make your record. I didn't over talk you. I didn't interrupt you. Is that fair to say? I let you. I let you make the record. With all due respect, when 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 will I be able to make the record? As I've tried to do numerous times by saying I off, I wanted to present an offer of proof for my appeal. That's the chance for me to be able to make the record. I'm denying your request to make an offer of proof regarding your appeal. It's so not. I'm, I'm not, not allowed to make the to record at all, Your Honor. Sir. I'm not allowed sir. to make the record at all. As I just let you did, because some some of the Sir, issues has I have, been some of the have issues has been. You told me what you want to do. I told Honor. you you can't. I've addressed your the Honor, request. Some of the issues have been me over talking you and interrupting you. I did not do that. Even though everything that you said, you have not proven for the record, and it's, it's unlawful law. You haven't shown one time that that's 
that it's lawful for you to do what you've been doing Mr. as far Price, as your rulings. Once again, I'm not going to debate with you the prior rulings of this court. There's absolutely no need at this point for you to your make Honor, an offer of proof regarding my prior rulings or decisions that you disagree with. Your Honor, you I'm will going have an to opportunity inform, if convicted going to, to raise jury, every issue you want on appeal. I'm going to inform the jury of the truth, their duties, and their rights as I have the right to do under the First Amendment and under the Sixth Amendment. You can't, you can't just disregard the United States Constitution. You can't do that. Again, any law repugnant of the United States Constitution is null and void. There's no state law that you can cite. There's no federal law that you can cite that overrides the United States Constitution. Mr. You know Brooks, this. I direct your attention to State versus Anthony, although that case dealt with the right to testify. Okay, so we're not talking about the right to testify. Applicable. We're talking about the closing, closing arguments, correct? We're so, not talking about testifying, which you Mr. already Brooks, made I'm a ruling on. I'm not going to delay you any already made a ruling on, arguments but of your the Honor, parties. With all due respect, I will address your further request with all due respect, state, you already made a ruling about testifying. Did you or did you not? Mr. Brooks? So we're talking about now... We're talking about closing arguments that I said it's my right to be able to inform the jury of the truth, their duties, and their rights. That that is my constitutional right. Mr. Brooks, you we can't are at the tell stage me of the I can't. Where it is the state's uh, burden of proof, where they get to make their closing arguments. We're talking first. about me though. I understand that, sir, but I'm going to inform your them of the truth. Right now is delaying. I'm not intending the courts to delay anything. I let you, with Your Honor. Argument. I just sat there and let you make the record. I didn't overtalk you or interrupt you. I let you say what you wanted to say. I let you make the record. I didn't interrupt you not one time. No, but sir, you're attempting to disrupt the proceedings by I'm going not off on a to disrupt into anything. all of these other issues. In, from my how, how perspective, I, that is in an how am I being dishonored? to simply how am I being in dishonor? How am so I being in dishonor? You are put on notice. I am done dealing how with How am these I being in dishonor, Your Honor? How am I being in dishonor of the court? Mr. Brooks, I've made my determination. And have I'm I not preserved my rights? This further. Have I not preserved my rights? If you insist on interrupting the court and disrupting the flow of these proceedings by a blatant disregard for the parameters that I've set up, you will. Forfeit your right to be present in this courtroom and potentially forfeit your right to present a closing argument. Under what lawful law can you do that? Sir, I've you made can, my determination. You can hold me in contempt by Illinois versus Allen. You can do that. You've, you've stated that numerous times. Mr. Brooks, I want you here for the closing arguments. Apparently but you, you do don't. Not Apparently you don't, Your rules. Honor, because all I said was it is my right under the First Amendment and the Sixth Amendment to inform the jury of the truth their rights and their duties. I never once said anything about, oh, I'm going to bring up subject matter, or I'm going to bring You're up right, this, sir. or I'm going to bring up that. And I will wait and see what you have to say, but I thought it prudent, given your conduct to date and your insistence on bringing up issues that have no bearing in this case. This is a new day, relevant. though, Your Honor. They're this is a whole new day. That it was prudent on my part to give you some guidance before you potentially... <clears throat> Uh, do that in front of the jury. Okay, but, right, but I will wait and see. Your Honor, it's, it's still... But I need to get going. It's still unconstitutional to, for you to so tell me that I don't have the First quiet. Amendment right that I preserved or the Sixth Mr. Amendment Brooks, right I'm that I preserved. I'm going to have the jury brought out. I expect that you will be respectful, courteous, and quiet. Or I'll be, or I'll be held in contempt. Opens, <laughs> or I'll be held in if contempt. If you insist on making remarks... Then I will excuse everyone from this courtroom and you will be removed because you will forfeit your right to be present for being disruptive. <clears throat> Under what lawful law? Because I haven't been ruling. dishonorable to the court. The, Madam Clerk, please have the jury brought out. Well, take me to the next courtroom then. Take me to the next courtroom because you're not, you're not going to override my constitutional rights just because you feel like you can and, and you don't have no lawful law to do that. We all have constitutional rights, and you cannot trample Brooks, on those. Mr. what you are raising are essentially issues that you can raise on appeal. No, I'm raising them now because they need to be on the record now. Because you won't allow me to make the record as I've let you do. You've even went so far as to mute Mr. me. Mr. Brooks, the which you can't even, There's no out. lawful law to say that you I'm can even mute me. I'm advising you to be quiet. They're coming Your Honor, out. does Illinois versus Allen say that you can utilize the mute button? It does not. Mr. Brooks, so when you're, the door you're, opens, I expect you to be quiet you're, and you will you're, forfeit and I your right to be for you present. To I expect for you to answer questions as a public servant, Your Honor. 
You're a public servant. The jury's coming You're in. supposed to serve the people. All right. Take me to the next courtroom. Please, take me to the next courtroom. Hold me in contempt. Hold me in contempt. Hold me in contempt. Hold me in contempt. I have, I have constitutional rights that are being trampled on, and you're coming up with ways to make a lawful law where it doesn't say in Illinois versus Allen anywhere about utilizing the, the mute button. reflect that the jury bailiff is in here. However, the jury is still in the hallway. Yeah. I'm going to give Mr. Brooks one more opportunity to be respectful of the court's rulings, whether no, no, he agrees with them I or not. I haven't dishonored the court. I'm, I'm merely exercising my rights under the Constitution, under the First Amendment, and under the Sixth Amendment. Mr. Brooks, your rights do not include you disrupting these proceedings I'm not, the way I'm that not you have through the, the course proceedings. of You just told weeks. me you don't have to honor my constitutional rights in so many words. You're using a mute button. Mr. Brooks, that's not the even jury is outside this door. They're not brought in. I'm informed that I'm the jury. I'm informed that the jury is outside the door. To be respectful of their time. They're not in the courtroom. I'm They're not present. I'm asking you to be respectful of the court's ruling. They're not you present. Agree with These are issues not. that need to be resolved before they are present. Mr. Brooks, they will not be resolved to your satisfaction. It's not about my satisfaction. It's about the Constitution. Made. It's about what's right. Are you going to? Are you going to answer questions as a public right. servant on why you're making up laws that are not in, in the uh, Illinois versus Allen and never utilized right, the, the mute button and never said anything about a mute button? It is clear why that Mr. Brooks has muted? absolutely no intention of following the simple rules of decorum and courtesy. He has repeatedly talked over me. He's repeatedly interrupted. Even though I've made rulings, he's not respectful of the fact that I made a ruling even though he disagrees with it. How can you I make attempted it? to bring the jury out, How can you and utilize a he continued to talk. That's that's. So, Mr. Brooks, your you Honor, have forfeited your right to be that, present for the state's is that closing not, argument. Your Honor, you will can be you ask taken this to question. the courtroom next As door, and I will servant, invite you back over when it's time for your you closing argument. You can't invite arguments. me back over. I can reclaim my right. So how can you invite me right, to do the anything? The courtroom is to be cleared so that Mr. Brooks can be removed to the next courtroom, and I'll make appropriate findings, findings when he's in the other courtroom yeah, when I can do so and you'll mute me, without, which you can't lawfully do. Um, interruption. You can't lawfully mute me. So now you're, now you're <laughs> trampling over my first amendment.
So I need it quiet in the courtroom, please. We are back on the record. Um, appearances are as they were before, except that Mr. Brooks has been uh, removed to the other courtroom. Um, the court did that because we came out on the record at 2 o'clock following the <coughs> lunch break. Uh, Mr. Brooks was brought to the main courtroom. Um, and during that almost 35 minutes or so, he was insistent on raising a variety of legal issues with which this court has either previously addressed or which are meritless and do not uh, warrant any further response. He is insistent on making a record and an offer of proof. Um, this would not be the appropriate procedural mechanism, meaning an offer of proof at this time. We are not in the midst of a trial where the courts made an evidentiary ruling that would require the preservation of the record by making an offer of proof. Um, this court uh, has been attempting, frankly, all day to get through the reading of jury instructions, to get to the point where the parties make their closing arguments, and ultimately to put this case in the jury's hands. It has been challenging. It has been met uh, by resistance from Mr. Brooks. Um, I would once again describe it as being stubbornly defiant, although at times he may wait for me to uh, make my ruling. He, c he continues to not respect the fact that a ruling has been made, and he wants to argue and re-argue and re-argue points that this court has already gone over. And in an effort to simply put him on notice regarding his behavior, given the history of this case, uh, the court was attempting to set some parameters regarding closing arguments so that they are focused, so that they are proper, um, and that they follow the law. That was met with a considerable amount of resistance and repeated statements by Mr. Brooks that he has um, First Amendment rights, Sixth Amendment rights, Fourteenth Amendment rights. He has all of those rights. That is not in dispute. But those rights do not come in a vacuum when we are in a court uh, proceeding and a trial such as this. Um, the rules of evidence, the rules of procedure, the rules of courtesy and decorum all <coughs> apply. And this case has demonstrated that a stubbornly defiant defendant can forfeit even important constitutional rights by conduct. Uh, that includes the right to be present. It included the right to present further witnesses and testimony. And it included the right of the defendant to testify on his own behalf. I hope that I do not have to go through um, a decision that forfeits his right or that makes a finding that he's forfeited his right to make a closing argument. I will certainly uh, wait and see how that goes. I would note he was very respectful when he did his opening statement. Um, it was clear. He made a variety of points. Um, he did so in a way that I would say was very um, conscientious of people's time. It was cogent. It was concise. It was probably about 35 minutes. I may be off a little bit, but that's what my memory is. It wasn't overly lengthy. Um, I would hope that he follows some of those same things here when he does his closing argument. But he has been removed from this courtroom because of his stubborn defiance and disrespect of this court of courtesy and decorum um, and what I truly believe is an effort on his part to continue to delay and lengthen these proceedings. Um, I've said it before, I'll state it again. Um, it is essential to the proper administration of criminal justice that dignity, order, and decorum be the hallmarks of all court proceedings in our country. The flagrant disregard in the courtroom of elementary standards of proper conduct should not and cannot be tolerated. And trial courts and trial judges that are confronted with disruptive, contemptuous, stubbornly defiant defendants must be given sufficient discretion to meet the circumstances of each case. 
No one formula for maintaining the appropriate courtroom atmosphere will be best in all situations. They noted three constitutionally permissible ways to handle such a stubbornly defiant defendant, um, but they also indicated that no one formula for maintaining the appropriate court atmosphere will be best in all situations. I've noted this before. This is a case from 1970. The technology that we now have in this brand new courtroom was not available then. Um, I have the ability to have Mr. Brooks appear from the other courtroom by way of audio and visual means. We can see him, he can see us. I've confirmed prior to calling the case that the audio was working, that the video is working. Uh, the one camera, there's four cameras in my courtroom, there's four cameras in his courtroom. However, it is set to one camera since he's the only individual there, um, other than the bailiffs, but I'm talking about as a party to the litigation. So the Courtroom, the cameras in my courtroom include one that would normally be on the witness stand that has been zoomed out so as to capture uh, the large majority of the jury box. I even adjusted the camera that's on the state's table so that uh, the exhibit that's currently up uh, to the my left, her right, Attorney Opper, is uh, viewable uh, in the camera angle. Um, and uh, she is still present within, meaning viewable within that as well. Um, and although I've made a finding that he has forfeited his right to be present for the state's closing argument, I'll find that the technology that I have available, uh, it is the, that his appearance from the other courtroom is the functional equivalent of appearing in this courtroom and being present uh, due to the uh, technology that is available. Um, I do have him on mute for the time being because I needed to make a record and there is a very lengthy history with Mr. Brooks during this case of him talking over me and my inability to make an adequate record if I am in a constant uh, back and forth with him and trying to talk over him. And so I, yes, made the decision to utilize the mute function on the incoming audio. I know he disagrees with my ability to do that, but I believe it is consistent with um, ensuring dignity, order, and decorum uh, that when appropriate, he be muted. I will advise Mr. Brooks once again that although he has lost his right to be present uh, in this courtroom, he can reclaim the right to be present as soon as he is willing to conduct himself consistently with the decorum and respect inherent in the concepts of courts and judicial proceedings. That includes not interrupting the court. That includes respecting when the court renders a decision by way of an oral ruling, even if he disagrees with it. Um, so with that, um, I will advise him that once the jury is brought out, I will unmute him. I expect that he will be respectful of them, and I expect that he will not interrupt as the court goes through the uh, couple of final jury instructions I need to go through, uh, including the reading of uh, jury instruction 160, closing arguments of the parties. And then I will turn it over to the state, but I will unmute him at that point. So should he have an objection, he will be able to state objection. I will be able to rule on it. And again, I expect him to honor whatever the ruling that is made. And if he does not do that, then I will utilize the mute function. Um, if he doesn't have it, we'll make sure he has the objection sign. And if I see that, I will unmute him to hear what it is and then make a ruling accordingly. Attorney Hopper. Your Honor, uh, two quick things. Please, could you confirm that the audio and video are working in the next courtroom? And the clerk's shaking her head. They've done that. Thank you. I don't know if you want to do it now or at a later time, but I think we should make a record as I will be displaying a PowerPoint during my closing argument, throughout my closing argument, and I'm not sure 
how that is projected in the next room or how it affects what we see in this room, Your Honor, but we should make a record of that at some point. Thank you. My understanding is Madam Clerk has the ability, uh, so that is displayed not only here, but in the neighboring courtroom. Um, if you would be so kind as when you start displaying it, just make some type of record, <clears throat> excuse me, so that the bailiff who's over there, if it's not being properly viewable, if it's not viewable, um, that we can stop and adjust sure. accordingly. Okay. Thank you. If you would like before the jury comes out, we could do a test. Yes, could we please? Please. Madam Clerk, would you confirm with the clerk over there that uh, the PowerPoint point is also viewable? They can see it. All right, and it should be the sim similarly to what we see. So the monitors will uh, display uh, the camera that Mr. Brooks is appearing, that is on Mr. Brooks on the left-hand side of the TV, and then the four cameras for this courtroom are on the right-hand side, but it's probably a maybe a quarter to a third of the screen and then the remainder of the screen is the PowerPoint. The monitors in the courtroom that Mr. Brooks is in are no different than what they are here. He would have one at the table, but he would also there would also be the very, very large TV monitor above the clerk over there. Well, it's smaller. And then the very large one over the witness stand. So it would be very similar to what is here. Um, if he were present in this courtroom. And again, I have uh, I know that the diagram, um, it's probably not the most easily seen from a camera, but it's really no different than what I'm looking at at the moment. Um, so I appreciate you asking that I make a record of that. Um, I would further make a record that there are headphones on the table where Mr. Brooks is currently standing. He has not put them on. Um, but they are available should he want them. All right, then are you turning off the all right, PowerPoint? Let us know when you need that function, and then Madam Clerk will be able to um, make that viewable in both courtrooms. Very good, thank you. All right, with that, the jury is to be brought out. <coughs> I'll rise for the jury, please. Thank you everyone, please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when I read the jury instruction to you previously regarding credibility, I had a prior version of the jury instruction. Now what I read to you at, in the very beginning, or at the very beginning of this case was the most recent. I am going to read a short paragraph, but also tell you that in the packet that will be sent with the jurors to the jury deliberation room, it will have the complete instruction. And it's instruction number 30, 300, excuse me. And this is what I want you to know about credibility. In your determination of credibility, you must avoid any and all bias based on the witness's race, national origin, religion, age, ability, gender identity, sexual orientation, education, 
income level, or any other personal characteristic. Consider carefully the closing arguments of the parties, but their arguments and conclusions and opinions are not evidence. Draw your own conclusions from the evidence and decide upon your verdict according to the evidence under the instructions given you by the court. With that, I will ask Attorney Opper to start with her closing argument. Go ahead. Hold on one second. Mr. Brooks, do you have an objection? I thought I, was supposed to, I thought I was supposed to be unmuted. You are now. All right. Uh, Attorney Offer, you may start. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, everybody. It's kind of nice to stand here in the middle of the courtroom, you know, all week or the last three weeks. They shoved me at the end of the table because I'm the lefty in the group. It's nice to be able to look at you all and say thank you truly thank you each and every one of you i want to express our sincere gratitude from the prosecution team myself deputy district attorney leslie Basie, assistant district attorney zach woodshell there's no one in this courtroom that does not realize the sacrifice that you've made serving your community in this very important task you've put your lives on hold I don't even want to hear from your bosses. Thank you. You've watched these proceedings and you've noticed as we sit at our prosecution table, we don't have a client at our table. But rest assured, we do represent someone. We represent the people of the state of Wisconsin. It's an entity. I can't bring it to the courtroom. People enact laws. People want to feel safe. People have representatives in Madison or Washington, D.C. that set standards, rules, that we all are expected to live by. And when those rules are violated, prosecutors step in and enforce the law. Daryl Brooks does not represent anybody. He does not have a client. Daryl Brooks is the client. Daryl Brooks is the defendant. The state of Wisconsin is the plaintiff. It's really that simple. And it's consistent with any other criminal case you've ever heard about at any other time in any other jurisdiction. It runs the same, no matter what state, state or federal. I'm going to ask you for your guilty vote at the end of my comments. It's up to you. I can't tell you to do anything, except I'm going to say one thing to you that I wholeheartedly ask you to obey. Attorney Upper, I'm sorry for the interruption. Your objection, sir? A mischaracterization of who I am and the way it was said, uh, I feel like it, it was talking down. All right, your objections noted, it's overruled. The state may continue. You must not, not, not consider anything about Daryl Brooks other than his conduct in downtown Waukesha on the evening of November 21, 2021. Nothing he's done before that, nothing he's done since that. When you go back to that deliberation room, please obey Judge Doro. Confine your comments to his conduct on November 21 of 21. Is he guilty of the 76 counts that he's been charged with? That and solely that should be your topic of discussion. So, what are the charges against Daryl Brooks? Thank you for your patience in listening to the jury instructions. They must be read for each and every count. But sadly, 
they can be summarized very quickly like this as far as the actual counts. Counts one through six are first degree intentional homicide while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts seven through 67, first degree recklessly endangering safety while armed with a dangerous weapon. Counts 68 through 74, hit and run causing death. Counts 75 and 76, bail jumping, and count 77, battery. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Brooks, what is your objection? Um, I have 76 charges, not 77. It's a mischaracter it's mischaracterization of the charges. Uh, that is correct. It is uh, sustained. It should be count 68 through 73, I believe, and then 74 through 75, and then 76. Thank you, Your Honor. I do apologize for my math skills. 68 through 73, 74 and 75 are bail jumping, and 76 is battery. I apologize for that misstatement. We're going to talk about counts 1 through 67 in detail. Counts 68 through 73, hit and run causing death, in my opinion, are easily summarized as this. He never stopped. Never. Bail jumping, he was out on bail for two files in Milwaukee County facing felony charges there. He was ordered to not commit any further crimes. If you believe he can, uh, was involved in any of the conduct charging counts 1 through 67, you should find him guilty of bail jumping. Battery, that relates to the split lip and black eye suffered by Erica Peterson. We told the story kind of backwards. We started with the battery for background. First degree intentional homicide. You've seen this in our opening statement. You've heard it from Judge Doral. Did Daryl Brooks cause the death of the victim, a victim? Did he have, I'm sorry, did he act with intent to kill, meaning either the mental purpose to take the life of another or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being? Count one, Ginny Sorensen. Count two, Lee Owen. Count three, Tamara Durand. Oh, I got, I got. Count four, Jane Kulik, count five, Bill Hospital, <clears throat> count six, Jackson Sparks. Those are the individuals who lost their lives because of the conduct of Daryl Brooks. From there we go to reckless endangering safety. What is that? In this case, it means that through his reckless driving, he endangered the safety of other people. And he did so demonstrating utter disregard for human life. Now, behind me is State's Exhibit 15. It's also on the PowerPoint. If you choose, you may have this chart with you in the deliberation room to help you walk through each of these counts if you find it helpful. It's up to you. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. But it will be available for you if you ask for it. And it'll take you, as we did in our presentation of the case, right down Main Street and address all the counts that were involved, all the counts that were charged. To prove reckless endangering safety, and I'm just going to go back one slide, Nowhere do you see there that we have to prove any degree of injury to anyone. Never once did Je Judge Doe instruct you that somebody has to be physically injured. Now, Detective Casey told you that was the standard we used in deciding of all these hundreds of thousands of people who is included in these charges. 
and a decision was made by the prosecution team to include people who were physically injured to be efficient in our prosecution. And so everybody up and down the street, I would argue, had their safety endangered that day. I didn't charge 5,000 counts. We selected 60, 61 counts of people that we can identify by name in Exhibit 15 that were injured by the conduct of Mr. Brooks. Those are the people in green, people in red are the fatalities. And we presented this case to you in much the same fashion that is presented here on Exhibit 15 as to how the injuries occurred going down that street. So we are absolutely held to our burden of proof and the elements for each offense that Judge Doro instructed you on, but we are not required to prove any injury to anybody. The question is, was their safety endangered by his reckless conduct, his reckless driving? <coughs> now, some of the groups, it's pretty easy. They walked in a formation and you can get a photograph or a diagram and you can kind of see pretty easily who was located where, right? And you can think back to the videos that you've seen for each of these groups and remember, and you'll see them again, the path of the vehicle as it went through each of these groups. This is South Band, of course. All of these names that are being displayed on the PowerPoint Exhibit 21 are on Exhibit 15 in green for Waukesha South Band. Pretty much the whole left half of the formation was endangered by the safety of Daryl Brooks driving up the side of that band. The Extreme Dance Team, it's a little difficult to read, but Again, this chart was marked as an exhibit. It's exhibit number 33. If you want it, you can have it in the jury room. The names on this chart will match the names for the extreme dance team on state's exhibit 15. All of the girls that were struck and injured as they marched with the extreme dance team, plus some people on the back that were handing out candy or serving in support roles as the uh, unit made its way down the street. The dancing grannies, States Exhibit 54, the formation that they marched in, who was located where, and your recollection of how that SUV zigzagged through that group, and you can just see the names and match it up to who was injured and killed versus who wasn't. Now, one of the big things in this case has always been, why did this happen? What was he thinking? Why did he do this? Again, those are things I don't necessarily have to prove to you. His intent I do have to prove, and I submit without any doubt there's overwhelming evidence that this was an intentional act by Daryl Brooks and an act of utter disregard for human life. I say that for these reasons, folks. Number one, first and foremost, just stop driving. That's it. It's really that simple. Not one person had to be hurt that day if he would have just stopped driving. Excuse me, Attorney Opera, your objection, sir? Um, you specifically, can, I'm sorry, can, can I be heard? Your objection, sir? Oh, I, didn't, I didn't know if I was on mute or not. Um, You're not? You, you specifically said in your jury instructions that 
intent cannot be you can't look into someone's mind i think is what it says to find intent so how could that be characterized as someone knowing for sure intent or not knowing for sure intent you're making an argument you'll have an opportunity to do that later your objections noted it's overruled the state may continue i apologize we we showed you at the very beginning, remember our first witness was Sergeant Warner, the man who was the incident commander for the parade. We put up another map. I think it states Exhibit 1. You can have that if you want it. Shows all the positions of all the police officers and the reserve officers, the barricades, the squad cars. How do I know it was intentional? Because even Daryl Brooks told Detective Carpenter, I could tell something was going on downtown. No reasonable person would drive upon this area, see the squads with their red and blues on, see the officers in the street with their bright yellow vests, see all the people milling around, see the, pl the floats lining up and the participants getting ready and not know to drive safely, slowly, and obey officers. The barricades help us prove it was intentional. The police presence help us prove it's intentional. The parade participants help us prove it's intentional. And the parade spectators help us prove it's intentional. Excuse me, Attorney Apple, your objection, sir? Speculation as to what the alleged defendant said he saw, it, Sir, it was never. Your objections noted it's overruled. This is closing arguments, not the evidentiary phase. Go ahead, so Attorney can, So how can speculation be made to what was saw? If your objections noted to? it's overruled. Continue, Attorney Opera. Honking the horn. Quite interesting that Mr. Brooks asked so many witnesses if they heard the horn honking. Some of them said they did at the beginning of the parade. Yeah, I heard a horn honk. Most of them said they didn't. The horn honking cuts both ways, folks. If he's honking his horn, that means he can see something's in front of him. That means he knows there's an object in the road. You can rely on your common experience in your affairs of everyday life. If you see something in the road and you want to alert the other person to your presence, you will honk. But you do not have the green light to then just keep going if they don't move. He knew they were there. Intent. I've skipped one. I'm sorry. Going back to my street. Number 15, I failed to include the uh, Catholic community. That's just one of the photographs showing the people that will match up to Exhibit 15 from the Catholic community of Waukesha. There's a lot of photographs identifying the people that were marching with that group. The parade started. This is the starting point or at least near the beginning, right? This is the area. We showed some videos of the groups passing by in this area. We heard testimony from four different police officers standing in four different spots near here telling of their four different efforts to stop him. Intentional. Sergeant Wanner's back here, testified that this red SUV blew by me. I waved both arms over my head. I'm in a police uniform. I have an unmarked squad, but I have my red and blues on. And he blew past me. He gets down here to the corner where Detective Casey is standing. Detective Casey runs out into the street, gets close enough to put his hand on the hood of the car. He keeps going. He comes down, turns onto Main Street, gets in this area of East Avenue to the south and Buckley Street to the north. This is where he encounters Officer Schneider and Officer Buttrin. They each make a separate effort to stop him and he keeps going. 
four police officers. It's intentional. He had plenty of opportunity to just stop. Anywhere along the way, one of the officers testified to it. I think it was Officer Schneider. This was an accident, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route after passing all this, and he mistakenly wandered onto the parade route. At any point, all he had to do was stop. They could have paused the parade. They could have moved the barricades and escorted him out. He didn't. It was intentional. He went on for four blocks. Four blocks. It was intentional. He reached speeds of approximately 30 miles an hour. That's intentional. He plowed through 68 different people, 68. How can you hit one and keep going? How can you hit two and keep going? How can you hit three and keep going? Didn't phase him a bit. He kept going until he got to the end and there was no more bodies to hit. It's Your intentional. Mischaracterization of the evidence. Noted, overruled. His conduct when he left the parade route, we'll get into this. His flight, his hiding, his panic, his desperation to run. Get the hell out of town as fast as he could before the cops came. That shows his intent. His interview with Detective Carpenter, we spent several hours playing you snippets of that interview. How telling was that? Never once did he say any of these things. Never once did he say, like he told you in his opening statement, it wasn't an, ac it was an accident, it wasn't intentional. Never said that to Detective Carpenter. No, he came up with some convoluted story about, I got a ride out here from a buddy in a tan Kia, and then I left to go meet Erica, and we got into a fight, and then I went back, and the other guy got into a fight, and he was leaving, so I took off on foot. Absolutely nonsensical story. Does not match up with the known evidence in this case. Overruled. He never stopped. I didn't even state the objection. This is closing argument. She may continue. I'm going to play this slide, which is a snippet from State's Exhibit Number 53. Go ahead and play with sound, please. <laughs> That was just a snippet that I selected because I thought it really captured the environment that so many witnesses tried to explain to you, right? It's a Christmas parade. People are there with their families, their little kids, their grandkids, their neighbors, their friends, strangers, standing next to strangers. That's what's going on on Main Street. While that's going on on Main Street, this is going on. Remember this? This is the gas station on the corner of Barstow and North Street. While the units are marching down Main Street, entertaining the crowd, Daryl Brooks is driving recklessly. He's enraged and he's arguing with Erica Patterson. Why is this important? This is important because before he even gets to the parade route, 
this is how he's driving. He could, drives the wrong way down North Street and then acts like it's everybody else's fault in the world. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opper. When he finally pulls into the gas station, he rolls down his window and yells at the driver who's properly stopped at the stoplight that it's somehow that guy's fault that Daryl Brooks is trying to drive the wrong way down North Street. And from there, the rage continues. We get to this point, States Exhibit number three. Please play. The video is playing. You can see the pushing match between Daryl Brooks, Corey Runkle, Erica Patterson, and Nick Kirby. Watch this. He turns to get in the car, flips up his hood, and goes and gets in the passenger seat. Sorry, I'm sorry, driver's seat. How long are we going to mischaracterize testimony? There's argument. I've heard nothing improper. Your objections noted. It's overruled. You may continue, Attorney Opper. Thank you. They need to know they can nullify. That's it. He drives off onto the parade route. From this moment, right here on Exhibit 15, you're watching it. He's enraged. He's angry. flips up that hood, and he zooms past Sergeant Warner, past Officer Casey, onto the parade route. Now, there's no doubt for the first two blocks, he does not strike anyone. And as we've discussed, some even said he was driving at a reasonable speed initially. By the time he gets past Officer Buttron and Officer Schneider in this area here of uh, East Avenue, past East Avenue. And clearly once he gets past Barstow, that's where it starts, right? That's where it starts. Nicole White, our first victim, walking with Remax and the hot air balloon. Knocks her over, keeps going, runs up and over the backs of Waukesha South Band, hits the green children spectating on the sidewalk, keeps going, runs over Kelly Grabo and her daughter Adelia watch, walking with Burris Logistics, keeps going, plows through the entire extreme dance team just before the five points, keeps going, hits Deborah Ramirez and her son Isaac spectating on the south side of the street, keeps going, clears the five points area, hits Jane Kulik, square on, causing her to go up on the hood of the car, and then fall off and drives over her body. He doesn't stop. He keeps going. Runs through the kids over by the steaming cup. We heard parents testify about little Brinley and Kelsey and Owen that were standing there outside the steaming cup. They were struck by the red SUV, driven by Daryl Brooks. Keeps going. Plows through the grannies in that zigzag fashion, striking most of them injuring them, killing them, keeps going, gets down here to the end and goes through the uh, Catholic community. The witness, uh, remember Holly Berg, she testified about that um, mobile gas station incident. She said she was standing down here in this area. She said, I saw 15 to 20 people fly in the air they look like bowling pins. And when she saw the video, she's absolutely right. It's a terrible description when you think these are human beings, but 
That's exactly what it looked like. When does the intent exist? Doesn't have to be even for a second. I'm not telling you who set out that morning to cause this carnage. But when he became enraged back here, he didn't give a damn who or what was in his way. He intentionally went on. I'll show you. Motive. I don't know why he did this. Folks, I don't know why. Other than the rage. He's right. You cannot read minds, neither can I. But the law doesn't require you to. The law gives you a way to reach a conclusion as to what is somebody thinking, and it's right here. Decide it based on his acts, words, and statements, and from all of the facts and circumstances. I've already been through many of them. I want to show you what I mean. Look at this. Was there room for him to get out? This is way back at the beginning. This is Officer Buttrin's squad video. Way back at the beginning, at Buckley Street here that you're looking at. Look at those barricades. Look at the sparse crowd. And there's Officer Schneider in her uh, yellow fluorescent vest on the left side of the picture, about to run into the street and stop him. <coughs> Intent. I'm going to play this video for you because, folks, for me, this is where it becomes crystal clear. You watch this video, the first thing you're going to see if you direct your attention to the left side of the screen is you're going to see him hit Kelly, I'm sorry, Nicole White. Knock her to the ground and keep going. Now, if that was the end of the story, you may sit here and say, Madam DA, I, I don't know how you conclude intent from that. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe he didn't mean to do it. But watch what happens in this video after he knocks Nicole White down and tell me this does not prove intent. Please play. watching the left side of your screen. drive over them and keep going. That's a still shot of the same thing. That's intent. I'm sorry to interrupt your objection, sir. How can you tell the jury what they're supposed to think? It's a proper argument. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. It's, I will argue that it's I will, I will say that it's improper and I Mr. move Brooks, I made my ruling. I'm going to mute you if you don't Follow the rules. Exhibit one. Exhibit one fifty two. Clearly, intentional conduct. Clearly, intentional conduct. States Exhibit ninety three. We ask the court to take time to have you go look at this car in person, because it's. Remarkably amazing <coughs> that this damage was caused by human beings. That's intent. This is an excerpt from State's Exhibit 154. Maybe a little hard to see. A lot of that laying in the front 
part of this uh, photo are shoes. Remember what Dr. Vidritsky said about the shoes and the feet, the scuff marks on the toes and the ankles? Look at all the shoes laying in the street. This is the area at the end when he ran through the Catholic community. All the shoes laying there because of the velocity, remember? The medical examiner talked about the velocity. It's not just the speed, it's the velocity. The power that these people were knocked right out of their shoes. That's intent. The flight, the hiding, changing his appearance. <coughs> he had to go through some effort, right? Crawled up in this uh, <coughs> playhouse ditched his sweatshirt and his sandal, the other sandal, seems pretty reasonable. He dropped it when he was jumping over a fence. Changed his appearance. Please play. Excuse me. Intent. What's he running from? What's he running from if he's just a lost guy with no ride back to Milwaukee? What's he running from as there's cops, sirens wailing in the background? Whoops, that was me. So, State's Exhibit number 130. Put that up here quickly. <coughs> Thank you. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, folks. Suffice it to say, after Officer Scolton tried to stop the threat at that intersection at the top, Wisconsin Avenue, and he blew through the barricades there and drove south on West Avenue over to Prospect Court, cutting through the yards and ditching the vehicle on Maple. You heard all the testimony about the commotion on Maple. The eyewitness testimony from Officer Sailors, off-duty police officer who saw this, saw the defendant, Darrell Brooks, he identified him for you in this court, get out and run from this car, and how we tracked him through the neighborhood. And again, the desperation whether he had to ask or use veiled threats like, I won't hurt you, but I need your phone. He was absolutely desperate to get out of there until he took refuge in the home of Daniel Ryder. Now remember the interesting thing, folks. None of these witnesses in this area knew anything about what happened at the parade. None of them. None of them were there. None of them were there. So they, some of them tried to help, some of them didn't. Daniel Ryder did, and it's actually probably a really good thing that he took him in because it stalled, right? It stalled him from keep running, kept him in one place until the cops could close in and get there. Now, Mr. Brooks repeatedly asked witnesses who had just watched their loved ones get struck by this SUV if they happen to catch a license plate. States Exhibit 150, there's the front license plate. Definitely a little blurry, but definitely you can make it out. States Exhibit 151, there's the rear plate. States Exhibit 175, there's Daryl Brooks in his music video with the same car and the same license plate. There's the key to the Ford that was found in Daryl Brooks' pocket. There's no doubt Daryl Brooks is the person responsible for this. Because this man in this picture is the same as this man in this picture wearing this sweatshirt. And again, it's a little hard to see, but you can ask for these exhibits in the jury room if you want. The photograph, you can see this design on the front of the 
uh, sweatshirt if you look close enough. This is a sweatshirt from the playset that has Daryl Brooks' DNA on it, according to the crime lab. That's him right there. That's Daryl Brooks driving off into the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That's Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. That is also Daryl Brooks driving in the parade. And so is that. And he kept asking people about the tints on the window. Well, guess what, folks? You don't need to see the tints on the window when the windows are rolled down. And there's clearly one person in that vehicle in every one of these photos. And it's that man. And it's that man. And it's that man. Daryl Edward Brooks Jr., date of birth 2-21-1982, on his identification card issued by the state of Wisconsin. In all capital letters, Daryl Edward Brooks Jr., this was in his pocket when they arrested him. So this entire shenanigans that he's presented to you through his questioning of witnesses about I'm not Daryl Brooks and that's my name and I don't know who that is and I don't uh, consent to being called that name. It's just nothing but a distraction. It's Daryl Brooks. It's the man who drove through the Waukesha Christmas Parade and killed people, injured people, endangered the safety of people. Sorry, your objection, sir? Uh, Your Honor, with all due respect, I, I would appreciate the uh, the quote unquote uh, language to t what, what does she mean by shenanigans and this and that and the third. Sir, your objections noted. It's overruled. The state may continue. Well, can can she tone that back? Because if that was me, if I would have said Mr. something Brooks, like that, Mr. Brooks, your objection it is noted. It's overruled. These are closing arguments. There's nothing I improper. Just, it's noted. It's overruled. To, she may continue. I just wanted. I just wanted to be fair. You'll have an opportunity to respond, sir. Please let her finish. So I can, I can rebuttal. Go ahead, Attorney Offer. Thank you. I'm going to conclude my comments with this, folks. I'm going to show you the video, a stitched together video of all the carnage caused by Daryl Brooks, and I apologize. Together. This is important that you know what he did. It's important that you think about the women like Nicole White and Kelly Grabo and her daughter and Jane Kulik who were just there with friends and co-workers supporting a local business. The teenagers marching in the band representing wearing their school colors. It's important, the boys and girls with the Blazers baseball team and their coaches doing nothing more than handing out baseball cards. The young girls in the extreme dance team, can you imagine how many hours they spent practicing that routine? He drove right through them without a care in the world. The grannies dancing their way down the street, perfect step, every one of them. The Catholic community there, as Father Matt said, spreading the light of Christ in the weeks before Christmas. He snuffed it out. It's time for Daryl Brooks to stop running. It's time for him to stop lying. It's time for him to be held accountable for his actions. Daryl Brooks cowardly rammed his way through this parade, violently killing and injuring so many people. I'm going to stop talking and play this video, but please, I ask you to add up the evidence. Use the map, 115, I'm sorry, 15. You can check off the names. We've covered them all. Walk down that street like we did with you. Return guilty ver verdicts on all counts. Please. Please. Screen back up.
No, I need one more. Uh, yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Before we continue with Mr. Brooks's closing arguments, I am going to take a short break. Um, I'll rise for the jury, please. Am I muted? No. <clears throat> the jury should know that they can nullify. You are muted now. be in recess for about 10 minutes.
Four of the record should reflect that Mr. Brooks is now present in the main courtroom uh, prior to reopening following the break. I did invite him back into the courtroom and he is here. I trust you are ready with your closing argument, sir. I'm ready to address subject matter jurisdiction as well, too. That request is denied. Just for the record, I was addressing it for both courtrooms here in courtroom number, I think it's 20. Mr. Brooks, I'm going to bring the jury out. Are you prepared to present your closing argument? I would like for you to prove subject matter jurisdiction on the record, Your Honor. I'm not addressing that any further than I've addressed already, sir. There's a written decision. I remind you of that. In that written decision, did, did I receive a, well, actually, I didn't receive anything. Was there copies made? Mr. Brooks, I'm going to ask you one more time. Are you prepared with your closing argument? I'm going to have the jury brought out. There is no I'm other in, legal arguments I I'm need to address of, from you at this time. I'm informed of what you're saying. I was merely asking, was there copies made of your, you say a written decision? Sir, my record, my written decision has been filed into the record. That is done electronically. You were provided with a written copy previously. Are you asking for another copy of that, sir? Yeah, because I, I don't have it. As a courtesy, I'll have my clerk print off a copy and provide that to you. Is it proven subject matter jurisdiction? Your objection to the lack of jurisdiction has been noted repeatedly on the record. It is a meritless argument. I've indicated that in my written decision as to why there is subject matter jurisdiction. And I will continue forward with the final stages of this trial, which I hope include your closing argument and then the final instructions to the jury. I will hope it, it, it prove subject matter jurisdiction on the record too. All right, I will instruct the jury to come out for the record. The written decision is once again being provided to I the accept defendant. for value and return for value this document as it is not based in lawful law and it does not prove subject matter jurisdiction whatsoever. It refers to a, some complaint that was filed in a uh, the name of a trust, not my name. Were you aware of that, Your Honor? Mr. Brooks, the jury has been asked to be brought out. I mean, I've requested that they be brought out, but they're on their way. Were you aware Please of that? Please be prepared with your closing argument. Were you aware of that, Your Honor? Or is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer any questions as a public servant? All right. So that is a tacit agreement. Record to reflect the jury is coming out. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Go ahead, sir. You may begin your closing argument. I'm not ready to begin closing arguments. So this is your opportunity to provide your closing argument to the jury. Please start. I've uh, started the timer I'm in, uh, of one hour. I'm informed of that, Your Honor, but I'm not ready to proceed as I don't understand the uh, <coughs> reason why the questions asked before the jury was present were not answered. There, there are issues that needed to be addressed outside of the jury, as you always say, which I don't understand why the jury deserves Mr. to Mr. Brooks, this know. is your opportunity to present your closing argument to the jury. Please do so. I'm informed of that, but the jury needs to understand the truth, their rights, and their duties, as they have not been informed of their truth, their rights, and their duties. Mr. Brooks, the court has begun the instruction process. I read 73 pages this morning and into the early afternoon. I have another 
30 plus pages to read. Did you inform They will be informed of the law. Did you inform them that they Mr. can Brooks? notify the law? Mr. Brooks, you do not have that right to request that. And Were I'm advising informed? you one more time, this is your opportunity to provide your closing argument. Please begin. I intend to when ready. I just want to know if the jury was informed that they can nullify the law. Uh, Mr. That Brooks, are, you have they no have right the to power. make that argument to the jury. It's true. They have the power. Um, all right. I'm going to excuse the jury. They should, they should know that they have the power. Please rise for the jury. Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Brooks, you do not have a right to request jury nullification directly from this jury. I direct your attention uh, to the Bajerkas case, B-J-E-R-K-A-S-S, that's State versus 163 Wisconsin 2nd 549. While you are not incorrect that the jury has the power to nullify, they don't have the right to do so and no party has the right to instruct or to request an instruction or to argue jury nullification. You may talk in terms of fairness in general terms, but you may not go further. You may not argue that the jury should discard the instructions and the law uh, and find you not guilty for that reason. You may not use the phrase jury nullification. You've done that now at least three times in earshot of the jury uh, twice uh, while you were in the other courtroom I was able to mute half of what you said the second time and then of course you raised that once again while in front of the jury just now um, you also indicated you weren't um, ready to give your closing argument sir this is the time has come for you to give your closing argument if you choose not to do so at this time then you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument by your conduct. I haven't made any such choice. So you can't coerce me into a constitutional right uh, waiver when I have not waived the constitutional right. And I will not allow you as a public servant to do that. I have not made a choice. Sir, this, the time has come for you to present your closing argument. Are you making a judicial determination that you're denying me a constitutional right in open court I have not court, made such a record. determination as of yet, but you can forfeit your constitutional rights Under by what conduct. lawful law? Uh, Illinois versus Allen, State versus Anthony. Illinois versus Allen does not reference anything pertaining to uh, rights when talking about in closing statements. In State versus statements. Anthony, uh, Illinois the Supreme Court Allen. of Wisconsin referenced both that decision uh, when it essentially extended the reasoning or adopted the reasoning of Illinois versus Allen uh, to then find that a defendant could forfeit an important constitutional right by conduct. In State versus Anthony, it was not the right to be present in the courtroom, it was the right to testify. Okay, so no, none of those the that you just named have anything to do with the closing arguments, Your Honor. You, you've used Illinois versus Allen repeatedly to when it comes to me being removed from the courtroom. Not one time did it bring up anything dealing with a closing statement or a closing argument. So how's that same uh, statute being used for something that it doesn't even refer to or pertain to? Mr. Brooks, the Allen decision, Illinois versus Allen, and the Anthony decision, which is State versus Anthony, are two examples of cases where a defendant lost a very important constitutional right because that right was forfeited by the conduct of that particular defendant. And that was to be present in trial, correct? The right to present a closing argument is no different. Because it is not evidence, um, 
It could be said that it doesn't even rank as high as the right to testify, which is guaranteed by the constitutions. Which I was denied the I'm right to I'm not prepared to, to make that to ruling to. here yet today, but I will tell you this, sir. The time has now come for you to present a closing argument. There will be no further delays. It's I not will a delay. not be taking any further um, adjournments for you to prepare. You were advised yesterday that this court would proceed today with instructing the jury and with the parties making their closing arguments. And you made that while it violating up, my constitutional sir, right. Sir, please don't interrupt me because well, you've now you interrupted did. me a couple of times. No, once. So let's Twice. make that correct. Once. That's the third time. Okay, now you can say So, two. Mr. Brooks, I'm advising you yet again. The time has now come. To being caught that's that another name, interruption. Honor. The time has now come for you to present your closing argument to this jury. And you were brought back over to this courtroom for that purpose. I'm going to let them that's know. That's another interruption. No, I'm going to let them know that they have rights and that they, they should be told, informed of the truth. It's not me are trying to give. Are you telling me, sir, that it's you not are going trying to, to give. Dis Let me ask you a no, question. Hello. I'm not trying to give any sir, jury instruction. Sir, you're interrupting me and you haven't let me finish. So are you telling me that you are going to disregard my very clear directive to you to not bring up the topic of jury nullification? That's not what I said. I'm asked, That's why I'm asking you. I don't understand that question because that's not what I said. Sir, you may not argue jury nullification I'm to this I'm going to jury. inform them of the truth. So you're going to inform them that they have the power of jury nullification? They do have the, you just said on the record that they have the power for, Sir, uh, I direct your attention You just said that. Did again. you not just say that, Your Honor? Sir, you the said jury, I couldn't instruct them The jury on has that. the power, but not the right to nullify. Right. A you said party, the power. You said the listen power. Listen to me, sir. You're interrupting me once again. So I'm going to inform them that they have the power. Are you telling me, sir, I'm that not you telling are you going no such to thing. disregard I just told you what you just said. my directive to you to not raise the issue of jury nullification during your closing argument? That's not what I said. You just read and said that they have the power to. That's what you just said, Your Honor. Sir, State versus Vijerkas says and stands for the proposition that although the jury has the power of jury nullification. Ah, they have no, the power. No party has the right to argue for jury nullification. I'm not arguing for it, Your Honor. In I just want them case, to be informed. The, I just want them sir, merely to be informed. You can That's call it. it informing, making them aware. Yeah, they, should, they should be aware of the You are not rights. allowed to make them aware of their power to nullify. That How is an improper argument your honor how can i not inform them that they have a power how because can i not, not inform right them of a power that have, they have sir. i'm not giving a new jury instruction that that's not what i'm arguing no jury instruction for jury nullification yeah, I'm sir, not, because I'm not, it's not allowed i'm not attempting to give them a new jury instruction i'm merely attempting to inform them of the power that they have Mr. that's Brooks, not against the law i'm advising you one more time you may not raise the issue of jury I'm going, nullification I'm going to, I'm going before to this jury. Inform them of the power that they have. I'm not you giving are them. Me I'm that not you giving are them a jury instruction. I'm telling them about jury nullification. That's, that's what I hear you saying. That's not what I said, though. Don't mischaracterize what I'm saying. You just read and said that they have the power. They have the power to do that. So how how is informing it's an inherent them? power that they have? They are not to be instructed on it. That um, is very clear in the law. In Your addition Honor. to, no, let me finish. In addition to the case that I just cited, I'd cite to you uh, from the jury instructions, uh, the law note on jury nullification 705. Um, what that says, sirs, I'm not going to read it all. It's many, many pages. But the bottom line is, it is improper for a court to allow a defendant or a defense attorney to make an argument or make the jury aware um, that they have the power to nullify a verdict. And Your Honor, you just added this last night. That's why I had to sit there for an hour in the holding cell and wait for you to change the whole paperwork because I brought that up. So you never intended for this to even be an issue. Mr. Brooks, it never was brought up. If you but think then I when I raised the issue, you Your Honor, let me that finish. I'm not prepared to deal with an argue on jury nullification. I didn't say, I, that's not what I said. 
That's not what I said. In all fairness, that's not what I said. The record should accurately reflect that you were kept in that holding cell Why was I kept so in there? that my clerk could finish adding the a jury instruction that was not there. Six verdict forms and it's times two because there's a guilty and a not guilty okay. for each. No, let me finish. Her. So, how did, so how did I have, why did I have to sit here for that where I could have just went to my cell and had it delivered? We had this Mr. at the Brooks. end of last at the end of last night before you call recess. I'm not going to debate that a whole, topic with you We had you a further. whole conversation about Mr. Brooks, you me are bringing up about the jury nullification. Disregarding this court, you, re, we you go can this. roll your eyes Here at we, me because all you want. It's ridiculous, Your Honor. You 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 just stated that they have the power to nullify. Would you Any like, law, if you would like, but then I, I said, read this to you, sir, the part of the case that's important, but you're not letting me get a word in edgewise. I'm trying my best not to remove you to the other courtroom, but that is oftentimes what I need to do in order for this court to make a full record without you interrupting me. But you need to be fully aware that you may not raise the issue of jury nullification in front of this jury. It is not an allowable argument or an advisement or making them aware. However you want to describe that, sir, whatever verbiage you want to put in front of it, you may not do so. And this court has the power and the authority to limit what you say to this jury, even in a closing argument. And if you're telling me through your conduct, through your words, that you are going to disregard that direction, you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument. Under what lawful law? Under State versus Anthony. That's, that, it doesn't refer to that. State versus it, Anthony it may doesn't. not have dealt with. It hasn't dealt with closing the arguments. The right to a closing argument, sir. It, but the reasoning, you just said nonetheless, it right there is no. fully applicable no, because you can't, the more you can't general change the law your honor you can't change the law that's practicing law from the, the bench law, sir, but the general principle i know you used to be in legislation but you can't practice law from the bench sir i'm you not can't practicing do that. law from the bench I you have, are if you're changing if you're ch your honor I'm not you're making, attempting you're attempting to make a a a, a separate case pertain to something here that it that, that doesn't even pertain to it it has nothing to do with a closing argument. Nothing that you just so, named. Not Mr. Illinois Brooks, versus Allen. I would like to make a record. Would you please show the courtesy and respect for I will, me to Your do Honor. that? I will. All right. So looking at the Anthony case, all right, and that case starting at Head Note 7, paragraph 54, says the following, and you need to let me get all the way through it. We have recognized two distinct ways in which a defendant may give up his rights waiver and forfeiture state versus pino is the first citation that they reference waiver is the intentional relinquishment or abandonment of a known right multiple citations there i won't repeat them all waiver typically applies to those rights so important to the administration of a fair trial that mere inaction on the part of a litigant is not sufficient to demonstrate that a party intended to forego that right state versus soto forfeiture on the other hand often involves the failure to make the timely assertion of a right. That's a cite to the Dina case and Olano. Rights that are subject to forfeiture are typically those whose relinquishment will not necessarily deprive a party of a fair trial and whose protection is best left to the immediacy of the trial, such as when a party fails to raise an evidentiary objection. However, there is a second aspect of forfeiture doing something incompatible with the assertion of a right. State versus Vaughn, 2012 Wisconsin Appellate 129, citing Illinois versus Allen, 397 uh, U.S. 337. They went on, the court, that is the Wisconsin Supreme Court in Anthony. As previously noted, we have held that the right to testify is subject to waiver, not forfeiture, insofar as a defendant's inaction in asserting the right is concerned. We now conclude that the right to testify may, in appropriate cases, be subject to forfeiture or conduct incompatible with the assertion of the right is at issue. 
They go on to discuss Allen, which was not a right to testify, but was a right to be present. And I am utilizing the guidance from Illinois versus Allen and State versus Anthony. It directly guides this court that a defendant may forfeit a right by conduct by doing something incompatible with the assertion of a right. In this particular case, you are very clearly telling me you are going to disregard what I told you about notifying the jury about nullification. You have absolutely no right to raise that in front of the jury. It is improper. And unless you're willing to tell me you will honor this ruling of mine, then you will forfeit your right to present a closing argument. That is my ruling. I object to that ruling, Your Honor. I object to that ruling. Are you willing to make a closing argument, sir, that does not reference jury nullification? I'm going to inform, inform the jury of their power. Again, I never stated that I was making a new jury instruction. I never sta in, uh, stated anything like that. And every case law that you just stated made no reference to closing arguments. It was all pertaining to uh, being present for the proceedings of trial and for testifying. Sir, Not what one I'm time did you, you hold on, I let, Your Honor, with all due respect, I let you make your record. I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead. Not one case law that you just cited made any reference whatsoever to a closing argument. Not one. So how is me merely informing the jury of the power and the rights that they have, how is that a forfeiture of being able to give a closing argument? Well, in addition to the cases I've just cited, sir, I'd also point you to State versus Bajerkas, 163 Wisconsin 2nd at on, 549. That's a, of, that's that's a Court of, of Appeals cases, case from 1991. That is the first published appellate decision in Wisconsin to consider directly several issues relating to the jury nullification issue. In that particular case, the court very clearly said that the defense counsel in that case was allowed to talk in terms of fairness in general terms, but not to go further and could not argue that the jury, quote, should disregard the instructions and the law and find her not guilty because it seems fair. That's a description of jury nullification. To use the words jury nullification would run afoul even more. And so I am telling you that given my inherent authority in controlling the mode and order of this court to ensure courtesy, decorum, and civility, and to ensure that this jury is presented with arguments that are proper under the law, I am hereby telling you I am in, in creating a rule for your closing argument that you may not raise the issue of jury nullification in any way. Your Honor, hold up. Hold up now. I'm the only one that has to be made rules for for closing arguments, but not the prosecution. How is that fair? How is that balanced? Mr. Brooks, I'm squarely faced with your defiance regarding the issue of jury nullification. It's that is defiance. requiring it's me not defiance. to address this issue and to tell you very Your Honor, expressly I that that is the rule I vehemently for your object closing to that. argument. Vehemently object to that. Your objection is noted for the record. But May I ask for a legal reconsideration stands. of your ruling? That request is denied. May I uh, respectfully ask for, uh, matter of fact, I reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling. Your for the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling? Not one pertaining to being present in the courtroom or testifying. One that specifically talks about a closing argument.
All of those requests are noted. I will not reconsider. I've put my findings and my reasoning on the record, and I stand by that record. For the record, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter? I'm not the form for which an appeal would be sought, sir. I cannot well, answer that. You, you referred to it before. You would need so to direct your appeal to, a, confused, your to Honor, a court of appeals, not this court. No, this is, I'm supposed to be in this admiralty court because you haven't, you haven't, is the, if, if we're under Article 3, then we should be in common law court. That hasn't even been addressed if we're in a common law court or an admiralty court. That's a baseless argument, sir. I don't and even need to what address law in it. Fact? Based on what law in fact? It's meritless. Based on what law in fact? Sir, I intend to bring this jury out and give you I'm an opportunity I'm informed of that. to present a closing argument. Yeah, if but you you're violate, also, you're please also, let me, listen, sir, you're interrupting you me yet rule, again. You just tried to put me under a rule that no one else was put under. The circumstances require that I implement this rule, sir, given your stubborn defiance on your the honor, issue of jury nullification. You can't place me under certain rules and not place the prosecution under the same rules. Sir, the circumstances of this case and your insistence on arguing jury nullification has resulted in I this court creating this rule. I haven't argued it. I said that I wanted to inform the jury of their power. I never once said I'm going to make an argument. I'm going to give them a jury instruction. You may not advise them that. or make them aware in any way that they have the power. And why not? Of jury why can't they be informed of their power? Because powers? it would violate the Bajurkas decision, sir. Violate what decision? All right, sir. I am going to bring the jury out. And I'm going to inform them that they have the power. And if you do that, I will dismiss the jury and I will declare that your right to present you a closing do that. argument Under what law has for been law? forfeited based upon I make oral, how I've outlined I make that today. I'm not going to declare that at this point because I want to see what you will do. Uh, but if you raise the issue of jury nullification, I will immediately dismiss the jury. You will forfeit your right you can't to do that. Uh, present a closing under argument. Under what lawful law can you? And then if you continue to interrupt under what me. what lawful law? You will be removed to the other courtroom as I complete the instructions. So I'm being held in contempt again. Is it civil or criminal? Your Honor. All right. Go ahead. I apologize. May I ask the court to consider perhaps an alternative, and I fully respect the ruling the court has just made, and I understand the basis for it. We all know the defendant in his petulance will say jury nullification in the first three seconds the jury's in the room. Objection the to that. Proper I don't thing think to do, I, I think, Your Honor. Stop to. interrupting, Attorney I don't think Opera, I should please. be talked down to. Allow him to make his closing argument. I will object if he misstates the law. You can instruct the jury to disregard any misstatements of the law. And we continue in that fashion, if possible, for a reasonable amount of time. And if it becomes to the point where there's no reasonable, legal, credible argument that's being made, then the court can decide as to whether or not he's forfeited his right to a closing argument. But we could at least try to, by merely objecting and the court telling the jury to disregard and instructing Mr. Brooks to move on to the next topic, we could try to allow him his opportunity to provide a closing argument. If that's unworkable, then I think this record will be very clear as to the efforts of this court. And I think um, there there is materials in the bench book, or I'm sorry, the jury instruction 705 um, that talk about a jury instruction this court could even give um, telling the jury that they are not at liberty to disregard the law, but we're not going that far yet because, um, frankly, you have told them and you will tell them that closing arguments are not evidence. And um, I think they will abide by that. So I know it's going to require um, effort for the court to, to allow this to um, allow Mr. Brooks to try and proceed. 
but I think we should try that or something similar to that in an effort to get through this next step or else we will continue at this pace forever. I'm certainly willing to try that. It's about all we could come up with, Your Honor. I mean, I'm certainly willing to try it in this courtroom, and the, if he disregards that, to excuse the jury, and then have him present from the other courtroom would be the second step, and then third would be a forfeiture. Agreed. Your Honor, I object to that. <clears throat> Your objection is noted for the record. That will be the course of action that this court takes. The first time you violate uh, the rule, you may be subject to forfeiting your right to be present where you will give the closing argument from the other courtroom. Um, and if you continue in a blatant disregard of the requirement that you not reference in any way jury nullification, I may make that final determination outside the presence of the jury. I object to that, Your Honor. All right, with that, let's bring the jury For out. For the record, may I respectfully request the legal reconsideration of your ruling? So is that a tacit agreement that you don't have to answer my objection, Your Honor? I decline to reconsider. I reject that ruling and take exception to that ruling, Your Honor. Noted for the record. For the record, may I request a legal or factual basis for your ruling, Your Honor? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully request a written judicial finding of facts and conclusion of law on this issue, Your Honor? Denied. For the record, may I respectfully move for interlocutory declaratory appeal on this matter? I'm not the court to address that. For the record, may I move to stay these proceedings until this instant matter is adjudicated by a court of competent jurisdiction, which this court has no All subject rise. matter jurisdiction. Denied. Under, uh, based on what law or fact? for the jury, please. Based on what law or fact? Because I'm going to inform the jury of their power. They deserve to know. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Go ahead, Mr. Brooks, your closing argument, please. Good afternoon. It's, it's been a long day. Um, first off, I'd just like to start by uh, letting you guys know that uh, It's a lot of information that you guys should be privy to, I believe. And uh, one thing that I believe that you have not been privy to is the truth of your rights and your duties. Being the jury, um, the fact that you and you alone have the power, not well-prepared DAs with well-prepared and clearly rehearsed uh, speeches and, and exhibits and a lot of theatrics. Frankly, not the judge. You and you alone have the power. You and you alone decide what is truth and what isn't truth. You should be informed that you have the power to nullify any law that you don't agree with. Objection, move to strike the statement. Sustain. Objection. I will strike from the record the last statement made by the defendant. The jury is, will disregard it. Which is clearly what I've been saying. I believe that not only is it fair 
but it's essential that you be privy to all knowledge, not knowledge that certain people feel that you should hear and shouldn't hear, disguised under the color of law. Um, the fact of the matter is, just like I did with uh, my opening um, statements, I don't have a well-prepared or rehearsed speech. <coughs> um, I didn't look in the mirror and say certain points to myself over and over again to make sure I have them right or, or anything like that. I've chosen to speak from the heart. In my opening statements, and now I'm gonna speak from the heart. What you won't hear me do is argue facts. And the reason you won't hear me argue facts is because I believe that it takes away from what should be recognized. The tragedy of this event, it should be recognized. <clears throat> Trying to argue facts of this, facts of that, I'm not going to waste your time doing that. It's a little emotional. I apologize for the long pause. It's hard to keep everything together emotionally. Um, and honestly, I don't believe that I have any more tears left. Um, it's, it's been a hard year. Um, for the families, mostly. Um, and that should not be lost on, on anyone. It, and it shouldn't be taken away. I said it before and I'll say it again. It's a lot of people that are, are healing, that are attempting to heal. Um, that opens the door to talk about uh, forgiveness for a little bit. Um, with every healing process, there comes a, a forgiving process. It's not an easy thing for anyone. Uh, what you've been hearing from the prosecution, and not to take any way away, uh, anything away from them, but let's call it what it is. You've been hearing a lot of rerun. Same things over and over and over. No different than when you turn on the radio and you first hear that song that you don't like when you first hear it. But they play it so much that eventually you start saying it, the words to yourself before you even realize it. And then you sit and you go, I hate that song. Why am I singing it? That's what's been happening. Rerun. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And over. Attempting to make things stick in your head that simply aren't true. Why do I say what am I saying? I say look at the testimony. You know, the, the, the thing from the prosecution here has been intent, 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 intent. We all know what's been said. We all know the picture that's been painted. Even the prosecution said themselves. 
How can you look in somebody's head and say, this is what they intended to do? You know, for, for a year, I've, I've sat and gone through this feeling so powerless, you know, letting other people run with the narratives. <laughs> Sitting back helpless while other people paint a picture that has zero truth, zero. I understand about healing myself, tragedy, pain, all that. A lot of it, there's no need to get into. Um, I myself in my own life have had to do a lot of healing. As a man with children myself, I find it hard to believe that anyone who's really had conversations with me, spent time around me, would think for one second that this is an intentional act. I've never heard of someone intentionally trying to hurt someone while attempting to blow their horn. <coughs> while uh, attempting to alert people of their presence. Which brings me to more information that I believe that you should have been privy to. And I'm sure that the prosecution will beg to differ, but the fact of the matter is the vehicle in question make a model of 2010 Ford Escape. The vehicle in question, actually 2008, 2009, and 2010 of that model was in fact recalled. Objection, misstatement of the facts, facts not in evidence. Was in fact, for argument, Your Honor. Sustained. Was in fact recalled. Was in fact a class action lawsuit against Ford Objection for those model for jury. those model vehicles. Sustained the jury will disregard information that you should have been privy to, that you weren't allowed to be privy to. Why I don't know. That information malfunctioning throttle bodies. Mr. Brooks, move out. It's information that you should have been privy to. Vehicles that malfunction and accelerate not being able to be stopped. Objection, that is key. It's information, accurate, it's information. Hold on. Go ahead. Move to strike statements by Sorry Mr. for the interruption. There are facts, not in evidence, <coughs> Your Honor, and it's complete misstatement. Sustained. Strike How is it a misstatement when I have the information? Mr. Brooks, move on. This is information that I feel like you needed to know. You should have known. Information that was taken away from you. Why? To prove a case? 
information that you definitely should have been privy to. says the defendant has an utter disregard for human life. Utter disregard for human life. Not realizing that they're talk about a, talking about someone that has, again, has children. Talking about someone that watch their children come out of the womb and be born into this world, cut the umbilical cord, held them before their mom even did. Moments that I'll never forget. And yet they say disregard, utter disregard for human life. They made reference to a rage as if they were, or if this particular DA was right there, standing right there, as if this DA is a psychiatrist. I said to myself, what, rage, what do you mean rage? How can you characterize that? How can you have the audacity to diagnose what someone's brain is? It, it, where it's at, what it's thinking, why it thinks the way it does. DA makes references to blocks of no one being injured, but then says it's intentional. You add that up with the supposed rage, the supposed intent to harm and kill, and it doesn't doesn't kick in until well within blocks. And maybe it's just me, but I would think if I was characterizing someone with this intent to kill and, and, this, and this, this rage and this anger then why weren't people immediately harmed? Why was someone with intent to kill and rage try to alert people of their presence, repeatedly honk their horn? You, you heard a detective, if you recall, testify that the vehicle that he observed was not only honking his horn, but was not speeding. So where does this rage kick in? Where this, this insatiable <clears throat> intent to kill kick in? They speak as someone who's known someone for years. Which brings me back to the vehicle. What if the vehicle couldn't stop because of the malfunction? Objection, fact, not in evidence. What if, what if the driver of the vehicle was unable to stop the vehicle? But 
because of that fact, what if the driver may have panicked? Does that make the driver a, a crazed, or not crazed, a, 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 a rage? Does that make the driver in a rage and intent on killing people? DA played a exhibit 17. You don't see anyone struck in that vehicle. On that exhibit, you don't see anyone struck. With someone who had this intent to kill, this rage, as, as she says, If that was their intent, wouldn't they have taken the opportunity to hit as many people as they could? Target people, mow down people. Reference was made to this vehicle, the Damage. Says this is all caused by bodies, but then later turns around and says, hits barricades and other objects. Her testimony about hearing loud crashes and, and, and things of that nature, but the DA wants you to believe that this all came from people. Evidence doesn't support that. So I go back to trying to wrap my head around everything that's happened in the last year. Praying for those families, praying for the people that tragically lost their life, because that should not be lost either. The fact that there was lives lost, and all the emphasis has been put on the alleged defendant. And the people have been disregarded. Makes me wonder, does the DA even care about those people? And prayers going up every day. It's been suffering on both sides. It's been threats, hate mail. Because of the narratives that's been put out there, the misconceptions that have been put out there, the lies that have been put out there, lies that have caused my children not to be able to go to school, to be bullied. for my mother to have to leave her home and stay at a hotel because she's afraid for her safety. Because she gets hate mail shoved through her, her mailbox. My nieces and nephews to fear for their safety. What's been equally hard is not only 
having to answer the questions from my daughter who was seven at the time, my baby, my baby girl who was seven at the time, is now eight. Attempting to ask, answer her questions that she's asking and still continue to shield her from what she sees, what she hears. Having a newborn son that I haven't even been able to meet. I haven't been able to hold, touch, kiss. Having to navigate everything that comes with this whole situation I'm still attempting to wrap my head around it. I can't honestly say how many times I've sat in my cell, especially during lights out, alone, where it's just you. And just then. <laughs> praying and asking myself, how could this happen? Not just for the people, but for everybody involved, the community too. How could this happen? How, hardest questions you can ask is those that don't have an answer. No matter how much thinking you do, no matter how much you try to look at it from different perspectives and listen to other outside perspectives and listen to people that you trust and that you love. Still coming up with nothing. But to think for one second, one 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 question I never had to ask was if this was intentional. That's something that never even I never asked once because I know it wasn't. As a matter of fact, it never even crossed my mind to even attempt to ask myself that because I know it wasn't. I know sometimes during this trial probably doesn't show. Maybe hard to believe. But trust me when I say no one outside of the families that had to go through this, no one's heart is more in pieces than mine. So again, I go back to all these exhibits. Go back to everything that's been shown, everything that's been testified to.
everything you've heard during this whole process, this trial? And again, I say the same thing that I said earlier. The same thing I said in opening statements. I'm not reading from any paper, any books. Everything you've heard in opening statements, everything you're hearing now is from right here. Everything. <coughs> you have the decision. You and you alone, all of you, you have the decision. I'm sure you've taken a lot of notes during this process. Some days are longer than others. A lot of movement in and out of the courtroom for various reasons. Remember the power that you have. Don't for one second let it be taken away from you. I can never understand the position of sitting on the jury and, and something of this magnitude. So I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure. I pray that the right decision is made. the right decision. It's almost like that, um, that message, well not message, but that writing when we're in our vehicles and it, we got that rear view mirror and it said things are closer than they appear. But it's also another way of saying sometimes things aren't as they appear. can't speak for anyone else but me myself I believe in Jesus Christ so I was raised that's what I believe in none of us are perfect I try every day to make sure that I acknowledge him. That's why every time I step in this courtroom, I have my Bible with me everywhere I go. I even read it on breaks, recesses. This is not something that started at the beginning of this incident. This is something that has been instilled in me since I came out of the womb. 
this is how my family lives their life. This is how we was raised. For whatever mistakes that I myself have made in my life, I made peace with with God. Made peace. I'm happy to say that my conscience is clear. Because I believe, I trust him with my life. <laughs> Nobody will never know why it was his will for this to happen. A lot of lives were changed that day, mine included. <coughs> God's way is not our own. And no matter how much sometimes we want to question, we have to have faith. Look inside yourself. Look inside yourself and make the right decision. Look inside your heart. You have everything in your hands now. everything <laughs> do was right do was right Don't let the smoke and mirrors take away your power. Don't let the theatrics take away your power. Each and every one of you has a decision.
is right. Make the right decision. It's hard to think about my younger kids getting older and at some point having to explain everything to them. <coughs> kids don't stay kids forever. Nowadays, kids is frankly a lot smarter than we were when we was kids. I tell you that much. I got a letter the other day. My youngest daughter. She's still learning cursive right now, so she's the best writer when it comes to cursive. She'd rather print. She said, Dad, and this is from the letter. She said, Dad, why are people saying all these mean things about you? I haven't read the rest of that yet, letter yet. <laughs> the rest of that sentence said, <laughs> That's not the dad I know. <laughs> Throughout this year, I've been called a lot of things. Fear, I am a lot of things. A murderer is not one of them. Never has been, never will be. So before I close my statements, I just want to say open your hearts.
massage yourself when making this decision. fear pray and do what you know is right what you know is right Think about everything you've heard. Think about everything you haven't been privileged to hear. Think about the whole entire picture. Above everything, whatever you decide, make sure you yourself can live with it. Make sure you can live with it. That's the magnitude of the power that you have. <coughs> Just like this tissue is in my hand, this is everything. You have everything. Be at peace with what you decide. Had no regrets. Don't let this decision weigh on you after it's over. Hopefully we got a long lot lot of living ahead of us. Lord willing. Don't look back and kick yourself in the behind. Spend about three weeks with you. took a lot of courage and a lot of guts to pause your life for this. To put important things on hold, to, to basically stop your life. You should be commended for being able to sit up here with this amount of pressure. I want you guys to know that's not lost on me. I'm sure it's a lot. And you all should be commended because it, it, it took courage to do this. I don't know, but I would bet a lot of people wouldn't want to be sitting in your position right now. And you guys had the guts to do it.
thank you for that. Thank you for taking pretty much a month and setting it to the side for this. I know it's probably not proper, but you, you guys deserve a round of applause if you could get one. Thank you guys sincerely. And and I know and I and I have faith and I trust that. guys know what's right ladies and gentlemen I, just, I don't think it's fair to just say guys but I believe in your heart you know you know what's right Before I give the state an opportunity um, to present rebuttal, please stand for a minute. So please stand. Have a seat, please. And Attorney Opper, I did time both closings. You have 1328 left. Thank you, Judge. I don't think that'll be an issue. <coughs> Folks, let me just say this. Mr. Brooks stands here and professes to speak to you from his heart. He plays on your sympathy, he talks about his children talks about the hardships that he's encountered and his family's encountered and he brushes over the loss to the community he wants to talk about how he's never held his newborn son never once acknowledges the Sorensen family the Owen family the Duran family the Hospital family, the Kulik family, the Sparks family. Never once. It's nice that Mr. Brooks can get letters from his loved ones. I don't know why he did this. I told you that. But actions define a person. It's that simple. You can stand with the Bible in your hands all day long and profess to be the finest man under God that you can be. But when you drive through a parade route and roll over children, children with band instruments, to the extent that your vehicle heaves up and down, Your intent is known, Mr. Brooks. It doesn't have to be guessed. It's known. You don't have to stand and wonder as he claims to. For him to keep going after he drove over those children in the band and have Jackson Sparks fly off the front hood of his car, lifeless, and keep going. And have Jane Kulik fly off the, light, the hood of his car, run her over, and keep going. I'm not going to go on. You get it. You need to look in the mirror, Mr. Brooks. If you want to accuse me of practicing my closing <coughs> argument, you need to look in the mirror, sir. Your actions are that of a murderer. 
You murdered these six people. You endangered the safety of 61 others. There are 68 victims in this case, folks. That's not an accident. That's not a, gee, I woke up one day and don't know how I found myself in this position. If you have some explaining to do to your children, Mr. Brooks, I recommend you do it. Now, members of the jury, the duties of the parties and the court have been performed. The case has been argued by the parties. The court has instructed you regarding the rules of law which should govern you in your deliberations. The time has now come with a great burden of reaching a just, fair, and conscientious decision of this case is to be thrown wholly upon you, the jurors, selected for this important duty. You will not be swayed by sympathy, prejudice, or passion. You will be very careful and deliberate in weighing the evidence. I charge you to keep your duty steadfastly in mind and as upright citizens to render a just and true verdict. You are to decide only whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty of the offenses charged. Any consequences of your verdict are matters for the court alone to decide and must not affect your deliberations. The following 76 forms of verdict will be submitted to you concerning the charges against the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks. Count one. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count two, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count two of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count two of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count three. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count three of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Darrell E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count three of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count four, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> count four, we, sorry, count four. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count four of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count four of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count five, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count five of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count five of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count six. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree <coughs> intentional homicide as charged in count six of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree intentional homicide as charged in count six of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree intentional homicide, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree intentional homicide while using a dangerous weapon? Count seven. 
One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count seven of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count seven of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count eight. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count eight of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count eight of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count nine. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree <laughs> recklessly endangering safety as charged in count nine of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count nine of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 10. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 10 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 10 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 11, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 11 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 11 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 12, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 12 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 12 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 13, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 13 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 13 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 14, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 14 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 14 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous <coughs> weapon? Count 15, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 15 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 15 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 16, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 16 of the information. Another reading, 
we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 16 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 17, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 17 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 17 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 18, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 18 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 18 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 19, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 19 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly <coughs> endangering safety as charged in count 19 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 20, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 20 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 20 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 21, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 21 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 21 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 22, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 22 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 22 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering <coughs> safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 23, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 23 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 23 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 24, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 24 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 24 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 25. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, 
not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 25 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Gerald E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 25 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 26, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 26 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 26 of the information. <clears throat> If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 27, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 27 of the information. Another reading, we the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 27 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 28, one reading, we the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 28 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 28 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 29, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 29 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 29 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 30, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 30 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 30 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 31, <laughs> one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 31 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 31 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 32, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 33 of the information. That should be 32. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 32 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? We're gonna have you take a short stand break while I confer with Madam Clerk. <coughs> Thank you. 
So I'm sure you have all the verdict forms, right? But this will need to be corrected. So I need yeah. to three. Okay, well, you could read one twice and then I'll make another one. you're ready, have a seat. Count 33. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 33 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 33 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 34, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 34 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant Daryl E. Brooks guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 34 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 35, one reading, we the jury find the defendant Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 35 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 35 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 36, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 36 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 36 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 37, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 37 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 37 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 38, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 38 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty a first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 38 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 39, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 39 of the information. Another reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 39 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, 
Answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 40. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 40 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 40 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 41. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, <coughs> Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 42. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 42 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 42 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 43. One reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 43 of the information. Another reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty a first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 43 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. <coughs> Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 44, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 41, sorry, 44 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 45. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 45 of the information. <coughs> Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 45 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 46, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 46 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, Guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 46 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 47. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 47 of the information. Another reading, we, the jury, find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 47 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 48. 
One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 48 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 48 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 49, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 49 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 49 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 50, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 50 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 50 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 51, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 51 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 51 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 52, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 52 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 52 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 53, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 53 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering <coughs> safety as charged in count 53 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 54, one reading, we the jury find the defendant Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 54 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 54 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree, recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree, recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 55, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 55 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 55 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 55 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? I think I'll give my jurors one more stand break before I conclude. So please stand and anyone else in the courtroom, please. <coughs> You can add them to this. Yep. 
And here's, if you want these, too. For now. Mm -hmm. That's more. Oh, yeah, it does reach it all this. Oh, did it? Yeah. Thank you. Have a seat. Count 56. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 56 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 56 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 57, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 57 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 57 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 58. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 58 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 58 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 59, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 59 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 59 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 60. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 60 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 60 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 61, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 61 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 61 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 62, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 62 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 62 of the information. If you find the defendant <coughs> guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 63, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 63 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty 
of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 63 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 64. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 64 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 64 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 65, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 65 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 65 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer, all of the, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 66. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count, set, count 66 of the information. I'll just repeat count 66. One reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 66 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 66 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 67, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 67 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety as charged in count 67 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of first degree recklessly endangering safety, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the defendant commit first degree recklessly endangering safety while using a dangerous weapon? Count 68, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 68 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 68 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Virginia Sorensen? Count 69, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 69 of the information. Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 69 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the accident cause death to Leanna Owen? Count 70, one reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, not guilty of hit and run as charged in count 70 of the information. <coughs> Another reading, we the jury find the defendant, Daryl E. Brooks, guilty of hit and run as charged in count 70 of the information. If you find the defendant guilty of hit and run, answer the following question, yes or no. Did the